Hello, I am Daniel Bloodworth. We are Easy Allies, and this is the Easy Allies podcast. This week, I'm joined by Isla Hink. Hi. Up on this desk. Hi. Uh, we've also got Michael Damiani. Hello. You should be playing Rebirth right now. <laughs> we should all be playing Rebirth right now. Damiani, I suck at blocking. Teach me how to block There's that. a materia that will help you do yeah, that. Yeah, I have it, and it doesn't help. <laughs> ah. The level, it has to level up. The, it's the precision blocking one, or is there another one that... No, uh, steadfast block. You want that one. I That's have better. that one, too. Okay. When it's maxed out, you take, like, no damage. Interesting. Okay. Block. Also, Queen's Blood is so good. Nice. <laughs> anyway, start the podcast. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in the control room, making it all happen, we got Don Casanova. Hello, hello, hello. And uh, Huber and Gabby are both out uh, this week. Um... But, uh, friends, we're going to talk about what's new, what's news, and what we've been playing. We're talking about that Bellatro. Hell yeah. Uh, we're talking about some Pokemon stuff. Sure. We've got that January sales report. Oh, sick. Uh, I put some time into that uh, roguelite mode for Splatoon 3. Oh. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's been a, a brutal week uh, with a lot of layoffs and other related <sighs> items to cover. Um, and because I've been jamming stuff in all this week, um, skipping, skipping the wrong question this week. No question this week. <gasps> Going right into Isla <gasps> playing Balatro. Oh my God. People dude. are obsessed Ooh. with this Bellatro game. Balatro is so good. <laughs> I slapped it on my Steam Deck. Uh, I was just in vacation in Hawaii. Got a bad sunburn on my chest, but I'm okay now. Uh, and yeah, so I was playing Balatro. In the hotel room, I think I still have pretty gnarly eye strain from oh, playing so much. From Bellatro. so much. Well, and and re rebirth, but like, uh, I was playing this on the plane. I was playing it on the thing. It's only sixty four megabytes. My friend Jason Wishnov was was gushing that he was like, it's pretty impressive. Like, obviously, like there's not a whole lot of graphics going on, but that's still pretty. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the um, funny thing because I I saw one of my uh, one of my contacts. Oh. <laughs> I uninstalled it. And then I'm like, and then they were playing it the next day, and they're like, I thought you uninstalled it. It's like, yeah, I reinstalled it. It's like, it's yeah. not a barrier. 64 <laughs> megabytes is not a barrier. Uninstalling it does nothing. It literally is like less than a second. <laughs> so uh, for the uninitiated, Bellatro, what is it? Well, it is a poker themed roguelike game, roguelite, whatever, um, where you go on runs to try to beat. Antes, which you know, it's just the theme for a level. It's just I had to look it up. I was like, "What does, what does anti seven mean?" And it's just mm. like level seven. Um, got it. Because I was like, I'm not paying an anti, so I don't know what's happening. But um, yeah, so you have cards. Every run, you start fresh, and you try to get as high as you can. Um, I haven't beat anti eight yet, but after that, I guess it kind of like opens up, and you like. Uh, go beyond that, and it gets insane. I hear the the difficulty jump is bananas past there. Um, I need to, I need pointers from Jason because he's he said he's a Bellatro whiz, but of course he's doing is. okay. Yeah, of course of, he is. Of course he, he is. has the power of math on his hand, <laughs> on his side. You know. Um, yeah, Jason Wishdove's a game developer. If you don't know, check out their game and Echo. Um, Anyway, uh, so yeah, you go and you try to make hands. You get new little cards, and you can add and remove cards from your deck to try to make your deck stronger. You can get joker cards, which build up um, and change your strategies. Like hmm. some of them are like get a you know times twelve multiplier if you play a, a hand that only has three cards in it or less, right? Okay. So it's like it would change how you are strategizing. And if you get a bunch that like proc on top of each other, you can get planet cards that upgrade the efficacy of a certain like hand, for example, as well. So like if you've gotten two pairs upgraded a bunch and you have a joker that gives you a big multiplier for two pair, uh, then you're gonna try to lean into getting a bunch of pairs, right? Uh, same if, you know, if you're trying to do a, str a straight or whatever. Um, and it, it's it's one of those games that sounds really stupid and simple to talk about, but when you're playing it, it's just it just works. Right. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like the the experience I've seen is like people just install it, it's like yeah, wh whatever, and then like yeah. 
then it's the next morning. Then four days have gone by, yeah, and you're exactly. like, what's happening? <laughs> and your eyes hurt still. Um, I turned down the CRT effect also. Oh, sure, sure. My eyes still hurt from playing this game so much. But, yeah. CRT effect on a Steam Deck is, is kind of funny to me. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah, it was. Like, what? Yeah, because I've only played it on my Steam Deck, so. Um, yeah, I don't know. This game rips. It, you, like... It's the ultimate one more run game. Like uh, you keep, you don't want to stop. Hmm. Like I, every time I stopped, I only stopped because my battery ran out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, I was trying to plug it in while I was, you know, but it was slow charging. Um, I I heard it. It sounded like people had a hard time getting their first win, but then once you get your first win, then it just starts to like snowball. How does that? They probably mean beating anti eight. Um, it's it's funny because like my first two or three runs were really really good. Weirdly, I made it to anti seven. I think like both times, the first couple of times I played after the tutorial, um, and then the bunch of my runs after that were way worse. Like I would die in like six or whatever, because um, I just didn't have as good of uh, RNG or whatever. I don't know that didn't get the same cards didn't get the same stuff. You can choose different decks to start with that do things like plus one hand size or plus one discard or plus, uh, you know, this and that and the other thing. There's a whole bunch of them. And you your collection increases as you find new things. Um, and so you sort of, that's the kind of rogue light element of it is that you're unlocking more things progressively and uh some of yeah, them how is that do you just like get them from a win or do you get cash from one and then buy them somewhere they, they unlock in different ways a okay. lot of them are like get 75 things in your collection which means like use oh, x amount okay. of packs and jokers and cards and and effects and stuff like that some of them are like get 10 card enchantment types or whatever you know stuff like that generally is how you unlock them um and then you don't you don't really start with money unless you use a certain deck that like gives you start with $10 or whatever. So you just get them by doing that. And then when you start the game over, sorry, you can choose that deck or whatever. Um, yeah. And certain jokers have different rarities. So like it's more or less rare that they'll show up in your run, but you can do other things to increase the chances of rare stuff to show, you know, all the, the whole kit and caboodle, the whole thing. Um, and yeah, you have discards, which is unusual, and your hand size is kind of variable. You end up with, you know, seven or eight cards usually uh, to pick from, and you're trying to make the best hands. And a lot of times you'll you'll make like one really good hand and just like win the blind on that. Or sometimes you you use all four or five of your hands to try and do it with smaller things. So like, it starts on anti one level one is like the small blind is three hundred dollars or whatever, which you can pretty easily make in a hand or two because you have no like any jokers or anything really to start out with and then by the end of it you know the blinds are like 40,000 or like mm. I, I hear later after like I hear in like anti 10 or whatever or 12 when it like super gets hard there's like 2 million dollar blinds and stuff and I'm just like I can't even picture that like the best I've I think I've gotten like 40,000 in a hand once and I was like feeling really good about myself and then Jason was like, I needed 2 million. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how's that possible? Uh. So it, it seems like there's definitely like a whole lot of other depth that I haven't even scratched the surface on yet. You know, and I've played maybe like, I don't know, I was on vacation. So it's like, I played probably like six or seven or eight hours of it. Cause you know, part of that was on a plane. Yeah. But yeah. Damian, you had thoughts? I mean, I'm looking at this. I mean, I'm always intimidated by card games, but uh, I enjoyed Queen's Blood. So Dude, Queen's these Blood? look like. I, but like the thing is, this is completely different. You describing it and me reading it, like they're like obviously, I you know, I'm biased against card games, or like they have a lot of variety. I can tell yeah. that at least that they play differently. This one seems like the enhancing stuff is like. Like yeah, it's about you mentioned RNG versus whether there's anything you do like prep wise, and since it's you you earn cards, but you like you don't earn anything else. I guess is that what you were saying? Like you you can like increase your collection of cards, you can, but you can change like the, so. I mean, you know, I've unlocked like four or five decks, you know. So um, okay, it, this may change, but like 
the stuff I've unlocked is um, different decks generally that you start the run with. And some of them give you extra hand size or hands per turn or discards. Or like, I think one of the ones I have gives you $10 to start the run. Um, stuff like that. So it's like things like that. Yeah. And I, they may or may not have different amounts of cards in them when they start. I think so far they've all just started regular 52 cards. But you can change that throughout your run. Okay. So you can control... I, I, it, it's a fun mix of... The RNG is just like, what card will you draw, like a normal card game, and what will show up in the shop. Um, but beyond that, like, you know, wi or within that, I should say, you can exercise as much control as you can exercise to, like, try to control what's happening. But, yeah. Okay. Then the two other questions I have, because I'm reading the Steam page on this. Tarot cards yeah. are in here and planet cards. Yeah. So tarot cards enhance an individual card and planet card enhances like your whole like hand is that how it uh, works or am i misunderstanding that's that? pretty close yeah um tarot cards usually yeah enhance like a card some of them there's a bunch of different effects but one of them just like uh you select two cards and it'll make them both bonus cards which give you extra multiplier mm. or extra uh chips so like you do a hand and okay. face cards and and aces give you 10 or 11 chips, and then every other number gives you that amount of numbers chips. So like an eight card gives you eight chips, whatever. Um, and then you have a multiplier applied to that. So like if you're playing two pair, like I was saying before, and like if that's base level 20 chips times two, you would get 40 chips for that, $40, 40 points, whatever. Um, so, like, the basic goal of the game is just to increase that chip number and increase that malt number. Um, so, tarot cards can do that. They can do different effects, like making cards, stuff like steel cards, where it's like, okay, if you keep this card in your hand and don't play it, it'll add a 1.5 multiplier to your whole uh, hand. Like, okay. And so you get, like, all kinds of wacky strategies, and they all have synergies like that. Planet cards... Um, basically up the effectiveness and you level up how powerful a type of hand is. So like okay. you level up straights or flushes or, or mm -hmm. full houses or pairs or high card. Um, okay, you were talking and about so like, idea, yeah. you know, like a high card is the, is the crappiest hand you can have um, and still like get something out of it. And, and like base level, it's like 10 chips times one or something like that, but you could level it up to be like more powerful. You know, it still isn't going to be as good as a straight flush, but you know, you can make it stronger if you wanted to, but maybe you get a Joker effect that's like, hey, do a high card and get a billion points, and you're like, okay. <laughs> From the the antis you played, w which of the three would you say is like the most important to being successful? Joker cards, tarot cards, or the planet cards? You really, you really need to have a good combination of all three. Oh. Okay. Um, but the in my early games, uh, I I just happened upon a perfect synergy of a really good couple of Joker cards that were procking on the same things mm. that I was able to upgrade with planet cards. Um, that run, I think it was full houses or three of a kinds or something like that, like kind of medium rare. So I was able to like discard and draw cards and get it fairly often. Uh, it might've been straights, but like, uh, so I had like two or three Jokers that were procking on that, giving it more chips and malting it. And then I'd upgraded it to like level three or four you know, and like I almost beat the 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 base game on like my second run, <laughs> which makes every other defeat feel so much worse. But right, <laughs> but yeah, you just kind of get lucky sometimes. But it's all strategy too. Anyway, I feel like Belotch was definitely one of those games where it's just like play it, just yeah, get it and play it, and it's easier than hearing about it. You know, because it's like kind of hard to describe it. The yeah. magic well, of it? Well, we're still hoping to, because, like, this is, like, full-on Huber bait, right? Oh, like, yeah. Like, get him on a stream. Like, and talking just... about this without Huber feels yeah. sacrilegious. <laughs> but, like, he's going to love I don't know if he's played it yet, but he's going to love it. Don, have you played this? You would love I this I haven't had a chance to play it at all. Yeah. 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 I haven't even cracked the seal. But you I and, intend to. You and Huber need to play this. Like, this is, this is like, it's like, it's like Darkest Dungeon or or Rogue, <laughs> Rogue Legacy but poker. Yeah. Like it's 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 the most Huber bait that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah. If there were like 
Shit, there might be like bonds in there. I don't know. I haven't unlocked everything. Right. So who knows? <laughs> Nice. Uh, moving on to uh, some headlines. Uh, last week we had a Nintendo Direct, but Pokemon likes to do their own thing. <laughs> so we had a Pokemon Presents this week. Oh. Uh, done on the anniversary of when Pokemon Red and Green were first released oh, in Japan. Yeah. Uh, started with a lot of quick updates on mobile games. Don, you can just go ahead and play this. I, I, I queued up this uh, Cafe Remix trailer just because it was really cute. But like... Yeah, Pokemon Go is getting some characters from the new series that's coming to Netflix. The Concierge series? Uh, Pokemon Horizons, oh, I guess. Oh, oh. I, yeah, because yeah, Concierge is already out. Have you yeah. seen Concierge? It's so cute. Uh, yeah, I think so. I anyway, think so. It's, it's really cute. Yeah. Uh, Raikou, uh, Entei, and Suicune are coming to Pokemon Sleep. Pokemon <laughs> Masters EX is getting an update. Every time Pokemon Sleep makes me yeah. laugh. Uh, this, uh, yeah, the Cafe Remix is getting events. Pokemon Un- Unite is getting characters, etc. And it was hilarious because even in the trailer, or in the in the pr- presents, they were like, "Moving on." <laughs> <laughs> After all the mobile games, moving, moving on. on. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm over here. I'm like, what is Pokemon Cafe? It looks kind of cute. Oh, uh, I think that was more of a puzzle game, right, Damiani? Let's start Which one? Pokemon Cafe. Cafe. Uh, I get them all mixed up. But yeah, I think it is. Damian Sorry, I, I, mean, I was up front. I'll give you behind the scenes. Like I told Blood, it was like I don't like I cur- have a cursory following of like these Pokemon things because there's there's so many of them at this point. Yeah, and I'm just like, you know what? Where, where, where's like where's the where's the big stuff? And then have they you know have they done? We'll get to it in a second. And I'm just like, there's just too much. I mean, I'm glad that people like enjoy it, but that stuff doesn't feel like it needed to be in, like i mean it's i guess it's pokemon presents it's pokemon day they're like yeah that's the celebrating thing. pokemon yeah. i mean i get it um, they're just doing little things know. in every pokemon game but also but right the point you, like but you also said like even they were like kind of like all right moving along it's like they 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 know what's up but i think there was more <laughs> that they were excited to talk about the biggest thing right. at the end yeah but obviously yeah but between like, those two this is a very interesting announcement i'm i'm curious to get your take damiani so uh, you can roll this. They're doing a Pokemon trading card game pocket. Wait, what? <laughs> so, so it's just a phone game of the paper card yes, game. Yes, yes. And, and they show I mean, everybody else has the one. opening a pack like a hundred times in this trailer. Like they just love showing that that finger going across the screen. Because that's the dopamine And hit. slicing open that pack. That's the dopamine, blood. They know what they're doing. <laughs> and the notification every time you get a pack too. They just keep showing that. Uh, but yeah, it is a, a digital version of, of the card game uh, with some differences. Uh, they seem to really, really, really be emphasizing the collection part of it. Yeah, I was like, can you play? Yeah, so there are. they called them quick battles uh-huh. that you can do, uh, but they say it's a simplified rule set. It's not the full <laughs> rule set. In the, in the trailer, <laughs> he was like trying to listen to this woman he's talking to but he noticed he got the, the got notification so he's like trying to look at his phone while still like nodding at her like uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> very real anyway uh but yeah so you do see some some uh, some smaller battles they have a thing in there too called uh immersive cards oh um and uh those are like basically they like they cr- create like a diorama out of the artwork Honestly, sort that's of, kind of pretty. Sort right? of like let you travel through the art a little bit. Yeah, these are awesome. I love this. This is kind of sick, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is stupid, but this is kind of sick. Um, and then they say you get uh, two packs per day for free. Just raw. Yeah. Huh. But then uh, if what's they're for the free, catch? then what? Ca- yeah, what's <laughs> how much the do they got to cost? What's the catch? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is getting primarily developed by uh, DNA, of course, with. I um, feel like creatures the, and Pokemon Company involved. I feel like the UI of that game is very strange. Like the background just being that kind of like milky white hmm. was kind of weird. Just a pack floating in the air. Yeah. Yeah. It feels. I don't know. It feels like there's. I don't know what else you would do, but there is a like a table when you're playing against somebody. But oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which they did not show in the trailer. They did show a little oh, bit. Okay, just okay. a little. Very quick. Yeah. yeah. But that's what I mean. That's why like the emphasis is so much yeah, on the packs. Yeah. 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 They know what they're getting into. Um, they even showed uh, kind of like behind the scenes of uh, when they uh, 
like with creatures, like when they make the the physical cards, they're showing them like kind of like evaluating them on the card stock and all of this oh, stuff. Yeah, that's fun. And so like well, this, you know, we put a lot of work into the real cards, and yeah. we're trying to make it feel just as special as we can on the phone too. And buy it again, mm. buy it a second time. <laughs> I mean, they get me with magic. I buy them in the game, and I buy them in real life. Sometimes. Yeah. The cards they showed off look pretty good. They do, yeah. And especially with the effects to enhance them that you can't do with a practical card. Mm -hmm. So that, that's you know pretty nice that they put that effort in here. Um, yeah, it, it, like it's good that they you know they're keeping this going. I mean, it's not the the first time they've brought trading card game to digital format. Yeah. Was it like was it GBA or Game Boy Color? What was the first? The, 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 oh the original yeah, they just made them on Game Boy. Yeah, Game Boy like Color, and then like they had the online one, like trading card online yeah. that ran for like forever. I don't even know if it's still up. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna it get is. down since they have this going right now. Um, I mean, the original Magic Online is still going, so. Yeah. It, it's just good to see them put this on, you know, under the devices. It's only on, like, an iOS and Android, but, you know, it's like people are like, could you maybe put this on even more platforms? But probably not. I mean, this is, like, it's not coming to Switch. <laughs> no. Right? I mean, it's that very saw. much a phone design, and it's being done by DNA. Although they did do Unite, so. Yeah, I was like, it could, I mean, absolutely could come to Switch. There were some Switch games that used the vertical orientation as well. True. So, I mean, that's... And you can that's, microtransact that, on there just as much as yeah. anything else. And, but also, like, the big one is, like, if uh, they ever get, like, Dane to put one of these things on, like, PC at some point. It's oh. like, sure. you know, was like, because Trading Card Game Online was on uh, Windows. So they put that on there. So will they do it again? It's like, will you give us access to this? Like, so will this one come to... Yeah. To PC, will this come to Switch? Um, so you know, keep your eyes out on that if that if that comes over. But yeah, I mean, the train card game is huge, so this is like a you know a nice way to like keep it going in a digital form. And also, past few years, like physical cards has been a pain in the ass to collect. Yeah, you know, if you're trying to get into it, it's just you know, scalpers and collectors have been like fighting you know over them left and right. So your newcomer trying to get in kind of sucks. So this is maybe like the next best thing. And, you know, you won't have, like, the physical tactile, but at least, you know, they're putting in the effort, it seems like, with the, the card designs and the effects so that you get something very aesthetically pleasing. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I, I really enjoy that. I mean, Magic Arena is my, like, only real uh, point of comparison on something like this. But I like the, like, animations of characters coming in and voice lines and all that stuff on the battlefield. I wonder how much they're going to do for that yeah. in here. But those immersive cards are cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. It's a fun idea. Chat is saying the original Pokemon TGC online is still up. Okay. I'm reading something that says it shut down last year, although it says progress was carried over, so I guess maybe there was a new version released. I don't again, I defer to you, Chad. I don't follow the, the trading card game at all. But yeah. I don't, like does that mean it might be transferring to this new one or are they gonna start clean? That's that would be like a question. there's a slightly newer version of the client for the old one. Okay, that's so they have the PC version running with this. Do you, I guess the question would be, will there be any interfacing between the mobile version and this? I wonder if you'll get PC like a yeah. like a bonus pack or something. Right. If yeah, because yeah. they didn't they didn't allude to that at all, at least in no, the trailer. Yeah. But it's still, you know, they haven't announced the release date either just this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you do follow, Damiani, we got our next uh, big boy. Uh, yeah. Although still kind of a spinoff, Pokemon Legends Z oh. to A, following up oh. on Arceus, um, in a way. But yeah. Well, yeah, they established what we a lot of us thought that Legends would become a new franchise. Yeah. yeah. For although it's not a pass game, so <laughs> as far as we like, I guess I mean we're guessing here it's not a pass game, but at least not in the far past from what we could tell. Like Arceus was. Yeah. I mean, um, there, there's some hints that it may actually be futuristic rather than. Yeah. Yeah. And then they got that logo. I mean, I've seen lots of like fun memes. Like, you know, people just call it pizza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I saw a Pokemon Legends Zelda because it looks like green Z A. And I'm like, yeah, they're watching. They're going to make it like Zelda like, even though it's not. Uh, the, the important thing from this is that after all these announcements, we do not have a mainline Pokemon coming out in 2024. Right. First time in I don't know when, but that is a good sign yeah, in terms say, of good. development team game freak maybe taking a little bit more time to develop these games probably saw like how scarlet and violet kind of like pushed the boundaries of like you know it sold very well 
people liked it, but it felt like the consensus was, man, can you just like put a little bit more polish on this? Spend a little bit more time. Like this would have sold well if you spent another six months or nine months or whatever on it anyway. Like why, why the rush? Like it could be even better. Yeah. And I, that's, that's part of it. That's like the, the copium answers that, Hey, they're actually finally listening. And even, you know, you could argue whether this is, this is a legend. This is not technically mainline, but RCS was a very big game, an original new concept. So we're kind of expecting, you know, big things from this as well. So I do think this is an ambitious project and I think it does need to take its time. The other thing is a lot of people were looking at this presentation for any indication for Nintendo to be kind of <laughs> tipping their hand at where Switch's successor might be falling. And there are people who thought if some kind of Pokemon was releasing this fall, then it's like, oh, that's like a holiday title. They're shoring up Nintendo's sales. They're going to help it pass, push past the milestone of becoming the best-selling platform of all time. And they're good through the holiday. But now it's this. is There's nothing in the holiday for Pokemon as far as we know. And nothing from Nintendo first party as far as we know yet. And it's like, hmm, that is a very wide gap. And we have all these rumors. So it's like, a is this... It, gap, yeah. It's like, would this be a launch title or a launch window? Which historically, they don't do that for the Pokemon company. They do not put right. uh, those games out right away. They like to have the install base built up. So would it be you know potentially cross-gen? But also... This, I mean, th 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 this game, it's like we, like, they didn't show off anything but, like, a concept video. So it'd be very telling if we see anything in action that's gameplay wise <laughs> right. in the coming months because there's a lot of people who think certain games can't be shown off yet, even if they're cross gen, because they have to officially announce Switch's successor and be like, this footage is running on the new hardware. Right. Um, this could easily come out in the first quarter of next year and still fit into this fisc coming upcoming fiscal year and the switch successor could fit into that six that fiscal year as well and it all adds up with all the reports so that's totally possible but it would be one hell of a launch title or launch window title to have a pokemon legends like this game at launch that's would be massive and would ensure like whatever amount they're trying to sell in that time frame would probably sell uh, unless it's, you know, unless, especially if they don't make a cross-gen. they don't make a cross-gen, you're going to have to buy that new hardware. But well, because the still new hardware will have a whole other gimmick. So that's why they can't show it, too, is we don't even know what the whole gimmick will be. <sighs> well, and the, other, the yeah. other question, too, is, you know, we don't know what, what cross-gen looks like. Right. They, they've, so, they've talked a lot about, you know, emphasizing backwards compatibility with Switch games and that kind of thing. So it could be, like, you buy a game and it's, you know, it, it's kind of like with the... Uh, the Xbox, you know, or it's like smart smart delivery or whatever. Mm. I mean, they used some interesting wording. They said switch platforms or switch like switch family of systems. They say that anyway. That's that's been but, an ongoing. Yeah, thing. That, that like yeah. The, okay, Very so we're like, all right, that's a catch all. But then like on the official announcement page on Pokemon.com, it says releasing simultaneously worldwide in 2025. And you're like, well, that just means everywhere in the world. But like. When has a Pokemon mainline Pokemon game been staggered, like a staggered right. like worldwide release? So like that seems very interesting to say that. Like when you hear it in other contexts, it's like mostly oh, it's releasing on like all platforms worldwide. So I I I, I think they're being a little bit cute with their wording here on purpose to be, hey, we're, we've we were being as ambiguous as possible. Um, but yeah, who knows? Like honestly, to me, it I I see this and I think, dang, yeah, maybe. Maybe the Switch successor is not coming out till like Q1 next year because they want to put this on uh, onto that and have it like be cross gen. Who knows? But for the concept itself, uh, we're going back to XY, the the Kalos region. Um, we're going back to Lumios City, uh, like the main like circle like yeah. city area of Based X on and Paris. Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paris, France. So we're getting a lot of that. And is it just going to be this city? And, you know, they're just going to scale that up because you remember Ar Arceus was massive, like these huge environments you got to go through with a hub environment. Is it going to be that where the city is just gonna be like, I mean, people are making fun of it saying, like, is it just going to be like Midgar and Final Fantasy VII where it's like just a giant like sprawling city? Well, just, like, it does, even it does sound like that because there's because yeah. I was reading something and saying that like it's not going to let you go out to the entire region. Um so is it, it the same region from Arceus? It's it? no, it's the region no, it's from, from uh, X and XY. Y. Oh, okay. X okay. and Y. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. 
So yeah, so that to me makes me feel like they are focusing more on that city itself. The other thing being these things that they threw in the trailer about like the urban redevelopment plan and the people in Pokemon living together. So I really wonder if it's going to be some like crazy multi-layered map that you're exploring like around rooftops and using different Pokemon effects to get higher up skyscrapers or mm -hmm. You know, maybe you, you know, jump into a fountain and go into some sewers, you know, like I, there's a lot of potential that you could actually do with the full cityscape. Yeah. I mean, we had that city environment with like Rhyme City and the Detective Pikachu game, but we like they're very sectioned off. So we've never really had like a giant like city to like walk through as like shown like in the movie of Detective Pikachu. It's like that would be kind of cool to just go through a living city or giant town for once in one of these games. Arceus, we were in the past, so like it, that hub environment was a little bit of a town, but uh, it, you know didn't feel as alive as it probably could have. So if they're going for something like this, it could be a unique concept where it's urban and like you're going on exploring and dealing with Pokemon in urban environments instead of like more natural environments, as you said, like going through buildings, going inside of buildings, going like maybe underground, going on rooftops, as you said. Who knows what other like clever things they're gonna throw in there, but. It's, you know, it's very intriguing if it is going to be confined to just like a city environment. I'm very curious. Uh, I'm also curious if it's going to be structured, as we said earlier, just like the first one. If it is going to be like mission based, like photo like a lot of it about it is just going out and capturing and, you know, documenting Pokemon. It's like, let, you know, there are battles, but like a lot of it is just like the exploration factor, mm -hmm. the in engagement with your environment. Will it rely as heavily on that? And what kind of quality of life refinements will they make um, on, on top of that as well? So, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty ec excited for this, especially if it's going to be on, like, new hardware and a launch title. I'm like, might be, like, the most excited I've been for, like, a Pokemon in a while. Uh, X and Y, I really liked X and Y. I reviewed it back at Game Trailers. Um, Kyle Bossman was, like, over my shoulder constantly <laughs> when I was doing that review. Um, he kept asking me what score I was giving it. And I was like, go away, Kyle. Go away, Kyle. <laughs> He's like, so what are you giving it? I was like, stop. Uh, what but did you give it? I gave it a nine. Hey. Um, but the big thing, yes, I saw chat. Uh, we, we were getting to it. Mega evolutions are yes. coming back. They showed at the end of the trailer. This was a, like, people now, like, love it. Uh, I felt like people had went back and forth on this for the longest time. But now it seems to be, like, back in vogue. So... Yeah, they're coming back. Maybe because everything we've seen since, people didn't like what they've done. So it's like, nah, give us back Mega Evolutions. These we'll, we'll take those. Those yeah, are pretty I kind good. Of explain so. what it's, it's, that's about too, right? Is like, you like temporarily evolve beyond the regular evolution? Uh, yeah, Mega Evolution. Uh, it's uh, further increases ability. I'm, I'm reading the description here. Uh, you need like the Keystone Pokemon. They hold a Mega Stone that, for the species, and then they Mega Evolve during the battle. Um, I remember like, what was it like, was it Mewtwo was like the, like the big one Charizard. Oh wait, every Pokemon is, never mind. I'm wrong. Every uh, Pokemon capable of mega evolution has one mega evolved form with the exception of Charizard and Mewtwo both have two. So yeah, they were, they, those were special ones, but yeah, that was, that was like a big deal when it happened. I remember that was like the start of them trying like something a little bit like crazy with like one of the gameplay hooks. I'm like, Oh, they're really going to go with this. And the evo yeah, like evolutions of Pokemon, like we the, the, like anything that takes some of like your favorite Pokemon and does something new with them, not just like a you know just appearance wise, but mechanically, like what abilities can they learn? Like how does it like impact like the battles? Because battle systems are the ones that like we constantly like feel are kind of like the same over and over throughout each generation with just like a little bit of tinkering here and there. So any like this was like I maybe like I'm misremembering, but to me. This is the first, oh, crap, like, they're trying, at least it's flashy. At least this is, like, standing out as something different. Even on a superficial level, it's not terribly, you know, revolutionizing the formula of the battle system in Pokemon. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, yeah, again, I'm very curious with the whole people in Pokemon living together, because, like you are saying, it's very, it feels very Detective Pikachu, that description. When it had, like... It was funny because the when it first sketched this the town, it almost looked like an Edwardian period or maybe earlier, and like that got me like, oh, is this especially with like things being covered over and like it was very monarch the like paper and stuff at the beginning. I was thinking like, 
Oh, is this when it like when when people in Pokemon like first started cohabitating really like in an urban setting? And then I was like, it would be kind of cool if I doubt it, but like it'd be kind of cool if it explored that like the the legal and emotional and societal ramifications of like like ba- basically like commingling, you know, like and then, and then you got the some, metaphors some are back there. alley thug radicates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, it'd like, be hey, interesting if they drew you parallels. You want to walk through here, hey, bud? To society, you know? Oh, yeah. I also forgot X and Y was the first one that chain- went away from sprites for all, like, 3D oh. representation oh. of Pokemon. Okay. So that's it was another big deal. I forgot about that. Um, I've just pictured these little, like, radicates in an alley, like, playing dice or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's our alley, see? Nice. Yeah. So, obviously... We haven't even seen the game yet, just a concept trailer. So we'll have to see where it goes from here. Because they can't show us what's on the Super Switch, blood. Right. Okay, next up, uh, I got to put a couple of hours into No Rest for the Wicked. Oh, right. Uh, this is the action RPG uh, from Moon Studio, the makers of Ori. Yeah. Uh, and this thing is is pretty sick. Uh, we sure love the, the, the character creators where you start off. Like, we have this, like... Total freakazoid Real, proportions. Interesting art style, yeah. Um, yeah, um, and what's interesting is you don't really change your body proportions. You just kind of change your face. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, you know, as you might expect, like really cool kind of that blending of like, these are 3D models, but it's very hand-painted style yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Don, you can go ahead and move on to the, uh, the, the opening cinema on this thing is just fully, fully gorgeous. Um, like just the, the lighting and everything that, that they've got going on and, um, uh, and there's good, uh, like pretty good character acting and stuff here. You, you oh, kind wow. of get this introduction where the, the old king has, has passed away and everyone's kind of. You know, uh, they're sort of paying their respects and then talking about the future. And uh, the the new king coming up is basically is like, all right, well, I'm going to go and <laughs> basically take over, it seems. Uh, what, is, what do you think? The pestilence is spreading. Um, so they're saying that, you know, it's the, the world will re- be reborn. Hmm. And then you like, just see a bunch of uh, ships going, going out to, uh, to take over these different areas. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, like, not long after this, you basically get, like, uh, washed up on a beach, and you punch some crabs and stuff like that. <laughs> classic, classic. Um, and then um, if, uh, uh, sorry, Don, you can actually skip to the next clip for this, because this, this first clip is a little bit on the slower side. Um, but, yeah, the uh, the gameplay itself is like... It's this interesting mashup almost of it's somewhere like between like Diablo and a Souls game. Okay. Um, so you've got the, the kind of top down look on the world. They also they said uh, in the, the preview materials that the world is curved a bit, kind of like Animal Crossing to right. like add okay. to the perspective. Um, and Don't but he hates it. Uh, <laughs> but then your um, your attacks and everything are are very deliberate. You've got a stamina meter. Uh, you've got a whole the the a weight system going on. So you have like depending on what kind of armor that you're wearing, you have like a light, normal, and heavy mode. Sure. Um, and it's interesting because your your dodges really change uh, based on that. So like when you're light, yeah, you get like this yeah. quick little dash. Um, and then medium, the normal, like you have more of a roll. Yeah. Uh, and then the heavy, there's still a roll, but then you also get this thing, which I think is interesting because it, it gives you a little bit more of an incentive to go heavy, is if you hold both trigger bus- buttons, you can like actually like r- like stampede into a person and oh. knock them over. That's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, you have to really pay pretty close attention to animation and all of that stuff like figure out when the right right time is to get in uh, and attack guys uh, there's also um, a fair amount of um, 
exploration, like I think this like emphasizes exploration a lot more uh, than even Diablo normally would because there's like all these little pockets of areas where you can like clamber into like this little hole or sure. crawl across cliffs or like if you run at um, if you run at a ledge, it'll you'll auto jump kind of oh, like okay. in uh, like Zelda's Ocarina of Time. So it's like you, you find a ledge and you run a, and you'll you'll hop across it. Uh, and so there's like a lot of chests and stuff uh, that you can find uh, that way. Um, and then I'm trying to think about what else. Oh, uh, and then leveling up, it's got um, a lot of the same kind of like uh, Souls-ish kinds of ways that you you uh, assign skill points. So you every level it seems like you get three skill points, uh, and then you've got your health and you've got your stamina. Uh, and then you've got the um, different things that scale with different weapons. So you've got strength and dex and int and faith. Okay. Uh, but then you also have. Um, I like your little mushroom hat. Yeah, yeah. I, I, found, I, found, I, I found this mushroom guy, and and he was kind of a pain in the butt because he was throwing firebombs a lot. Mm. Uh, but I found the mushroom hat. Um, another thing that was interesting with the weight is that it seems like sometimes when you eat. Uh, certain foods it will temporarily boost um, like your your weight because I would actually like go back Girl, and forth. Girl, I hear that. Some yeah, <laughs> but no, it's like sometimes it like temporarily like make you lighter. Oh. Um, and so I would have these things like I you know I would eat like some mushroom stew or whatever, and mm-hmm. like okay now I'm I'm a little bit lighter now I can do the a fast dodge. Up. You got a little energy. Yeah. 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 That's so it's cool. it's interesting. There is. Um, there are a lot of like little like um, resource points and stuff too. So you pick up things like axes that you can't use in combat, as well as like pickaxes and like fishing poles and stuff like that, so that you can get like wood and um, like uh, different types of like metals mm-hmm. and like and and fishing that you can you can buy recipes and then you can cook the recipes uh, with with different effects. And that was actually one of the things that like I'm like having a, a little bit of a hard hard time with is like when I got to uh, the boss fight is that like I was burning through food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you go back to the checkpoint when you die, like it doesn't reset to the state you were in. Oh, um, no. It was like no, like all of that food that I burned is burned. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's also some things Ooh. too with um, when you die, it affects the durability of your weapons as well. Hmm. So when you you die, you lose weapon durability, and then eventually you have to start repairing it. Uh, and then same thing with like your different, um, uh, like your your armor and, and stuff like that. But it was especially like early on uh, where this starts off, it was pretty tricky trying to find that balance of, you know, I've I've got better armor, but it's making me too heavy, and and figuring figuring all of that out. Right. Um, there's also um, there's a little bit of a stealth system to where if you can manage to sneak up on somebody, you can get a good backstab in on them. Uh, won't always necessarily kill them, but you can stab them and then knock them over. Um, and then yeah, that that boss was just like a real like super freako, um, like just this big huge honking thing that was like eating bodies on a battlefield or whatever. Oh. <laughs> um, cool designs. Like the enemy and boss designs here especially are really crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. he he, he kind of swings around a lot. And so it took took a, quite a few tries for me to figure out like when it was safe for me to to move out of the way and, and block with a shield. And, and afterwards I read the – preview guide and it was like oh you you know you can parry him and i'm like okay oh wow <laughs> i did not i was not brave enough to try to, to parry this crazy dude um but uh i did see a couple of other weapons uh so there's like i had like a regular sword um there is uh you can hold the button to charge um do a stronger attack that way yeah. there's also um if you hold the right bumper uh there's like a set of attacks they call uh runic attacks and so basically you have that orange bar between your xp bar and your health bar Mm -hmm. and when the orange bar fills up then you can use your runic attacks and so basically you you hold r r1 to toggle 
and then you can execute that. And the one with the main sword I was using was like a like a kind of dash in and uppercut, uh, but you still have to time it well. It can be totally interrupted. Uh, and so then you've just burned your meter and right. got hit at the same time. Um, but I also uh, had found like a pair of little stabby daggers. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> which I, like, I thought you might like, but then you no, don't have your yeah. shield, but obviously you don't usually use a shield. I never so. use a shield, yeah. Uh, I also found like a big old uh, honking claymore. So oh, if yeah. you're into that great sword kind of build, you can go at that. Because um, I was wondering like the, the movement and attacking and stuff seemed pretty deliberate in the first footage that we were seeing. Like it didn't even look like you were running, but I think now you're kind of dashing all around and stuff. So it seemed like you were just RP walking, I guess, some of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, so like you can hold, so you, yeah, so it's an A button to, to dodge and then you can hold it to run. Mm -hmm. But it um, burns stamina pretty fast, it looks like. Um, yeah, like, uh, it, what's interesting is that I think that you can still dodge when you have no stamina, hmm. but you're just, then you're not recovering. Like it's stopping you sure, from recovering. Sure. To, so, so I think that's kind of an interesting concession there. Yeah. Um. But, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think about what else there is. Um, oh, yeah, I did, I, I did pick up some rings, too. So I got a feather ring. So I, oh, cool. that helped me with the equip load there. I like accessories. Yeah. Um, definitely has the, uh, the nice little shortcuts with, like, knocking down ladders or... Uh, uh, I'm transfixed by this B-roll blood. <laughs> you, you almost won. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> he beat knocking the boss. Knocking for a bridge. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so far, yeah, it's it's feeling pretty good. Cool. Uh, it looks really freaking it's cool. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the, like the character interactions and stuff are really gorgeous. Um, and uh, you know, this is this is going up after they just had their own uh, live stream and they've got other people streaming it and stuff too. Cool. Uh, so you can see some other people play through this this section. Um, Do we have a date or anything on this or? As of my right now, I don't think that we have a date. Mm. Um, but I don't know what they've announced <laughs> during the stream. They, right. might, they yeah. might have actually announced the date already by the time you're watching this. So, um, But it's looking promising. Obviously, I love Ori, love the gameplay feel of Ori, and I like what I feel from this so far. Yeah. Um, you just, you know, you have to be, you have to learn those attack patterns and stuff, you know. Um, but it's, like I said, it's a little bit on that slower pace to where it makes sense. It's like, okay, swing, 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 and then back up. <laughs> yeah. Because somebody's going to come at you with something. Cool. Damiani, you had any questions? Since I know you liked Ori, but you're not as yeah, much into these, was... these top-down action RPGs as often. I mean, this is incredible that they can make something that looks like this coming off of Ori. Yeah. Like, you just... Gameplay wise, it's so drastically different than Ori, yet, you know, just shows how talented they are. So good to sound good to see it's coming along nicely. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm definitely eager to uh to play more now. All right. Let's get into that January sales report. Uh I'm a little a little bummed that it happened on a week that you was out, but it, it, it once in a while. We're talking about poker, we're talking about sales reports. Yep. <laughs> Don't go on vacation, Huber. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. He's celebrating family birthdays. It's all good. Yeah. Um, from uh, Circana, Matt Pescatella, uh, projected total market spending grew 15% in January uh, compared to a year ago, uh, reaching $5.1 billion for the Whee! month. Uh, but he did note that this January is f a five-week period. Last January was a four-week period. Ah, uh, very sneaky. One of those. It's not sneaky. It's just the the <laughs> things line up differently some years. Yeah. Um. Uh. He's also been doing these these engagement trackers, looking at monthly active users. Hmm. You know who topped that? Who? Pal World. Oh, of course. Oh, of topped course. that monthly engagement tracker on Steam. Uh, on Xbox, it was in third place behind Fortnite and Call of Duty. Wow. Uh, and Shrouded also did well. Yeah, I've um, heard that's uh, doing really well. Yeah, seventh on Steam for monthly active that's users. That's huge. That's really good. Um, January hardware spending fell 4% compared to January 2023. 
Makes uh, sense. Uh, growth in Xbox hardware dollar sales was unable to offset declines across other platforms. Uh, PS5 was best selling um, both in units and dollars. Switch was second in unit sales. Xbox was second in dollar sales. Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, this is one of the big ones. And this will come up later. Uh, with 39 months in the market, life to date unit sales of PlayStation 5 are now tracking 7%. Ahead of PlayStation 4's pace, oh. and 68 percent above the PlayStation 3. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, poor PS3. <laughs> yeah, way behind PlayStation 2, probably. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see the PlayStation 2 comparison because um, that is definitely the fastest. Yeah. But uh, yeah, still, PS4. Poor PS3. <laughs> PS4 was doing really well. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and PS3, it took those price cuts and things to get people there. Yeah. Uh, it eventually did get there though. Uh, spending on accessories increased 45% compared to January 2023. Game pad spending uh, Drift for Huber there. Oh yeah, yeah. Game pad spending increased by over 50% year on year, with the DualSense Edge being mm. the best-selling accessory. That's been the of best-selling course. accessory for a mm-hmm. few months. Yeah, Drift on PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, Represent planned Huber. obsolescence, right? <laughs> planned drift. <laughs> Uh, also, in terms of funny tracking things, uh, they moved the PlayStation Portal from the hardware category to the accessories category. They were trying to figure out what to do with this thing. <laughs> I okay. would say that that actually makes sense. Yeah. Because you you n- can't do anything with it by a, itself. You need a main unit to use it. So it is, by nature, an accessory. It's just yep. a very flashy accessory. Uh, it ranked... Uh, f- Those things are hard to get. Yeah. Luckily, Warframe fifth. came out on with cross saves, so now I don't need a portal. But, yeah. Yeah. Couldn't get one. I tried. I looked like uh, every everywhere. Couldn't find it. Yeah. It ranked fifth among video game accessories in consumer spending, largely because they're just selling what they can make yeah. right now. They're, they're going out the door as soon as they come in. All right. Which, let's... which surprised me, mm-hmm. honestly. Like, we all kind of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we all like, kind of laughed thing is useless. at it. Yeah. We were all kind of <laughs> like, eh. And I think, honestly, that IGN review. Because that's what I saw that I was like, oh, maybe there's something to this thing where he was like, I was surprised. Like, this thing's actually pretty good, you know? I think maybe that turns some people around. Certainly it impacted me. Let's get into the top 20 for the month, though. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six new games. And this is January. For January. Okay. So yep. What the hell happened in January? There's Hell a lot Divers 2? Was that January? What's that? There's a lot of games that came There's out Hell in January. January? And, uh, Hell Divers 2 is not January. However, I do have no. some Hell Divers 2 news. Oh. Preview for next month. Uh, the U.S. combined physical and digital dollar sales of Hell Divers 2 during its second week more than doubled the launch week volume. That, That's like, very never unusual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Way to go, dude. That's called legs. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Word of mouth. That game is sick. Yeah, super <laughs> word of mouth on that one. But that is a February game. Right. So we got uh, the new games were uh, were Tekken 8. Tekken 8. Oh, Persona, Tekken 8. Yep, Tekken 8 yeah. debuted at second place. Persona is Pers- at fourth. Persona 3 Tekken. Reload. Prince of Persia, Lost Crown. Mm. Prince of Persia was at 13th. Yep. Mm. Uh, Suicide Squad. Oh, that was Lord. last one. <laughs> Suicide <laughs> Squad is in third place. Oh. oh. Despite uh, that. Being and disappointing was, still, though. Oh, sure. And the one Huber was playing. I thought uh, that might have been first. Now I'm curious. Wait, what is going to be first? I mean, number one's Call of Duty. Has to be. Yeah, it's Call of Duty. Oh, Call of Duty. <laughs> it doesn't have to be, but it is. It doesn't yeah, have it to does. be, but it is. That it's close to solid. holiday, yes. Society, it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> Jan- you need like a megaton in January to like yeah. beat Call of Duty every year. There's one more that you good. should get and one more that you probably won't well, get. Well, what was the one that Huber was playing? I can't... Uh, the. The, the 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 Sega series, not yes. Persona, the yes. other Sega game. Like a Dragon Infinite Well. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Gosh. I can't Seventh the place. Title. Hey, wow. That's really good. Where'd that Momodora chart, blood? <laughs> Momodora. I, I got a Momodora. What? Dang it. Um, our other new one is uh, Jujutsu Kaisen Cursed oh. Clash at 19th oh, place. Oh, wow. Yeah. Anime game. <laughs> the power of anime. The power of anime. Well, Bandai Namco's getting rid of anime games. <gasps> huh? No, what? that was the joke when they said they're consolidating on like 
established IP. So I was like, what about licensed games? Yeah, <laughs> that's and very like, established. Uh, IP. It's like, well, because like they don't make like some of their anime games haven't been very good lately. So <laughs> I mean, I'd People say like, that's always been the case. It's a uh, it's I a mean, crap, it's a crapshoot, man. So, yeah, some of those games are good. Some of them are whatever. Your 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 anime games, your your Call of Duties, is your Pokemon's, your Madden's. They don't have to be good to sell. Well, I mean, actual anime license versus like anime s games, like Tales. Tales right, right, like right. Sells decently, but That's like yeah, I mean. their anime license games, like One Piece and Dragon Ball. Well, Dragon Ball's like de- generally sells decently, yeah. no matter what they do with it. But the Naruto and the one Piece games seem to maybe not sell as well as they used yeah. to, especially Naruto because they're like just shoving Boruto. Sorry, oh, you are not, yeah, not I mean, here to defend just it. They're running that thing dry. But, but people but... don't want to play Boruto at this. I point. I heard that I'm Boruto sorry. sucks, and that people who like Boruto <laughs> suck. That's what I heard. <laughs> I heard people like Boruto suffer drift on their PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, they get abnormal amounts of PlayStation controller drift. It hears you say Boruto, and it's like <laughs> drift. <laughs> and they don't like meaningful kills or shotguns or poker games. That's what I've heard. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> or bonds. Um, about that Tekken Eight though, Tekken Eight uh, surpassed a million oh, yeah. on its first day. Wow. Nice. Uh, two million in its first month. So that's pretty good. That's really good. That's good to hear, especially after what Harada said about the development of cost of Tekken 8 being like how many times more expensive than Tekken 7? Two mm-hmm. times, that's, almost three times more than Tekken 7. Wow. And like how much more expensive the games make today than they were in the 90s? Yeah, you said like 10 times that. It's like, yeah, that's like Makes a million sense. sounds great, but, you know, is it enough? Like this is right. the question we're going to be asking now, especially with all the layoffs that have been happening and the, the like everyone doubling down on established IPs, playing it safe, only making safe bets, is a million per game enough? Is five million enough? It's like, I don't know. It, it, like, is there even a magic number that's even safe? Right. Like, it doesn't might not even matter. No, like, it, it's, yeah. I mean, obviously, it just comes back to budgets and marketing yeah, budgets varies. and all that stuff. But, you know, but that's the thing, like, with the Suicide Squad thing, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's not meeting our expectations. And I'm like, we, we everyone tried to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Everyone tried to tell you on that. Um, but Still third, though. Yeah, that's the thing. It's still third. Um, the active users have gone oh, down sure. pretty s- steeply. But it, again, like, when I was playing it, it's like, this just feels like a single-player game. But then you would maybe go back for a second playthrough with some friends. Yeah, yeah. It's real weird. That's a weird game. But then... The other problem the, w, the problem the WB has is that Hogwarts sold so insanely last year that nothing that happens this year is going to look good right. as a comparison point. Right. Like you just can't. You can't compete with your own self. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. why like some of these issues like with the layoffs and the stock markets and all this stuff like it's that's why they're kind of ridiculous because they're looking you're looking at these short-term markers and Games take four, five, six, seven, eight years to put out. And it's yeah. like, yeah, your short term marker is going to look weird when you haven't put a GTA game out forever. Well, Blood, you can, <laughs> you can rest easy because business people are known for their long term thinking. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, we'll see what where Suicide Squad ends up next month. I think yeah. that'll be like the telling story that we oh, probably yeah. already know the answer to. I would guess not in the top 20, but who knows? Um, anything else that you want to to poke? A at? very like I is mean I ring in there? I was like oh is what's that Elden Ring on there? Oh Elden Ring gonna, is at fourteenth. Yeah, I, I was just gonna comment on Persona that you know I know it's a re-release remake, but mm. still very shocked it got like that high. I know like the like the newer newer entries do you know top the charts like Persona Five did. Um, Would this one hit seven? Uh, Persona was fourth. Fourth, wow. like a dragon was seventh. Right. Okay. Okay. And yeah, here's so. here's my one of my theories on this, Damiani, because both of them were the fastest selling in their series. Uh huh. The both of these series have been very aggressively put onto Game Pass. Yeah. So I think this is sort of paying dividends for them to where it's like they've gotten people a space where they can easily catch up yeah. on these long series and get people in the doors. Like, I've always been curious about Persona, but I've never tried it kind of thing. And now they've tried it. 
They mm -hmm. love it. I've never played Persona 3. Oh, there's a remaster. Cool. Yeah. And there you go. Now yeah. it's the fastest selling Persona game ever. That's a good point. I wonder if do like the Tales games and Xenoblade and all that, they should do that kind of thing. Or uh, huge sales or something. Tales, I think, has been on Game Pass. Yeah. I don't think like comprehensively. But Xenoblade I, obviously wouldn't be, but. Yeah. Yeah. Tales doesn't sell like these, though. Yeah. I, I mean, if anything reading into this, I mean, obviously, like a dragon, the you know, it's all, like it's great that it's like charting. I, I think. My I, I my takeaway from this is that when Persona Six launches, if they're smart and make it multi-platform mm -hmm. and not PlayStation exclusive, it is a serious shot at number one and be like breaking some records for that series if they do that because Persona Three was multi-platform <laughs> and it charted and it's a remaster. It's a re so it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a very it's probably like in the running for like. The, the the most popular you know the modern three not just like the entire persona series but like it would probably give five a run for its money and four but i still think six is like primed to just yeah shatter records if they're smart about it yeah it'll be i know it won't hit this high probably but it would be very funny if black flag is on this next month oh right <laughs> yeah because the player uh, base went up to the cover your ears done <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, just think we're Skull and Bones lands too. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a, yeah, Black Skull and Bones is at 19 and, and Black Flag's at like seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Sorry. here's the full list. 20th place, we got God of War Ragnarok. Oh, huh. uh, uh, still going. Yeah. Uh, 19th is uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. Uh, 18th okay. is Mario Kart 8. Oh, yeah. it's getting close to slipping oh, off. To slip off. Time for that. Time for that Mario Kart Nine we'll Switch see. Two announcement. Right alongside it, seventeenth Minecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, then sixteenth uh, Gran Turismo Seven, still doing wow. really oh. well there. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That popped back up from twenty first. Fifteenth uh, Mortal Kombat One, starting to dip down a bit. Um, oh yeah, that's another thing that WB had last year. So they had like a. Uh, mm, mm -hmm. One two punch there. Yeah, not sure what else they've got. Like Mortal this Kombat, year. while it sells well, it tends to like only stay up for a few months and then drops off. Yeah, like like a lot of these fighting games like do that. I'm just yeah. Mortal like Kombat seems to be the ones like sells the most in terms of like yeah. volume. Yeah. yeah, even though uh, yeah, uh, people are really into to Tekken and Street Fighter. It's like Mortal Kombat seems to outsell them. Yeah, yeah, I would wager MK is the king of sales there, and then like Smash is in different class because it's not just a fighting game. Uh, 14, we've got Elden Ring. 13, we got Prince of Persia. 12th, Avatar. Hey, Don. Oh, Still hanging in there. There you go, Don. That's good go. news. That's good news. Uh, 11th is Super Mario Brothers. Wonder. 10th is Spider-Man 2. Uh, 9th is The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, popping up Wait. from 167. Wh so I why? guess they're putting the new version in with this version? It's got, it's got to be. The Wait, Last of Us Part Two remastered has got to be. This was not remastered. This it just the says old... The Last of Us Part Two, but it came it out must be January yeah. and it popped up from one sixty seven. Yeah, that, they that, must be yeah, combining. I'm guessing them. you're right. Yeah, yeah they have makes to no be. Sense so that's a weird one. Uh, eighth is uh, EA Sports FC twenty four. Seventh is Like a Dragon. Sixth is Hogwarts. Fifth is Madden. Fourth is Persona. Third is Suicide Squads. Second is Tekken 8. And first is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Congrats to Call of Duty. <laughs> Congrats yeah, to Call of that. Duty. Shadow the Earth Tree bump for Elden no, Ring. No, that's what I was thinking. That's going to go back yeah, to Yeah, it'll come back up. For sure. Dip just a bit. Then it'll come back. I'm thinking about like... Okay, I'm on like New Game Plus 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 or something on my main character. It's like I should probably... Just start. That was over. gonna be like my yeah, like like my May project is to like yeah, get a get back safe. That's like <laughs> all right. We're at the end, yeah. and I'm like I'm good, and I just gotta go walk over <laughs> to the spot, yeah. and teleport over, and activate. Like Let's I'll go. try it, obviously, but I made that mistake with Dark Souls Two, where I went to the DLC on like New Game Plus Plus, and it was like real hard. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, there's no way to branch your character or de-level them or something. It would be interesting Ooh. if they gave you that option. 
You like could if level you could go areas. into the Elden Ring DLC, yeah, and like, hey, do you want to like bump the levels? Go down to the magic bit? school. I, I think that would actually be really nice. If they yeah, could, yeah. you could level certain areas up in Dark Souls too. But yeah, that was very cool. I love Dark Souls too. Everybody, shut up. Dark Souls two is good. Ooh. I don't know who everybody is. your way out of shit. <laughs> the new Elden Ring DLC will boast a leveling system similar to that of Sekiro, so you won't be able to grind your way. Oh. Ooh. ooh a new Famitsu interview said Uh-oh. that. Ooh. It, I'm not, I'm, I, so it's not going to matter. <laughs> it's gonna well, I mean, if it doesn't, <laughs> that's interesting. Because then, well, then uh, I guess in a weird way, New Game Plus wouldn't matter because they would be the same... Yep, it's not gonna matter. matter. I mean, I guess that's good if it doesn't matter. We'll see. I don't know. I don't. I don't love that. Yeah, just need to find the new broken meta. Go fast before they nerf it. There's a lot of weird questions there for sure. That ah, that's confusing. I don't love that. Okay, we'll find out. Yeah. We got. Let me solo oh. her, please. Show up. Let me solo her. Yeah. <laughs> <What's up? laughs> Help me beat that snake person. We've got more to come, but if you've been enjoying the show so far, please stay a second to like and subscribe and ring that bell on YouTube. Also, leave us a review on those podcast apps. It helps us and helps you stay connected. All right. I finally got uh, a little bit of time in on this uh, Splatoon 3 side order DLC. Oh, yeah. Uh, It's pretty cool. It is basically, if you're not familiar with this thing, uh, it is a uh, a roguelite mode that they've added to uh, Splatoon 3. And, uh, yeah, you you go to this other area, and then, like, Pearl, for whatever reason, is, like, encased in a drone, and she's talking to you, and you're going up floors and uh, fighting all these new enemies and stuff. Uh, They're called uh, gelatins. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Like fish skeletons, but like in inky, uh, you know, like blackness. So it's like, yeah. Gelatins. So, gelatins. Like jellyfish skeletons? Yeah. That's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and each one of these levels is very, very quick. Like I was beating some of these levels in like 16 seconds or oh, whatever. Wow. Um, oh. There's uh, different types of objectives. Um, and so sometimes like... Yeah, you'll have like the same objective but on a different level or whatever. So there are some where you just like have to defeat like the spawn points. There are some where you have like essentially what look like um, uh, like billiard balls that you have to get into different uh, uh, like like holes, and they have to like sit there long enough to like actually sink in or whatever. Um, and then um, this is very weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and everything is desaturated. Yeah. Um, Color-wise. Um, but, yeah, so you kind of work your way up the floors doing all these, like, mini levels. Um, and then each level, you get a chip, a color chip that goes into your palette. Okay. Um, and these do all sorts of different things. So, like, uh, some of them will, like, uh, increase your bonuses from streaks. Some of them will increase, uh, like, uh, your... Uh, like your range of your weapons or your power of your weapons and things like that. Some of them will make uh, your ink poison uh, to different enemies. Okay. Um, and uh, and then as like you're going up the floors, some of the floors will have um, vending machines. So that as you're getting currency within a run, <gasps> you can buy stuff in the vending machine, including extra lives. Like let it die. Uh, um, yeah. And, and so you can get some chips from a vending machine or you can also get some extra lives, but you're limited... Your stock, um, like you start off with like just one life, mm. and then between runs you can go to Marina at the bottom of the tower, and and you can buy things from her with pearls that you get at the end of the run. Basically, it con- it like converts all of the things that you got in that run into pearls, uh-huh. and then okay. you can buy those like th- that's the roguelite part of it. You can buy those yeah. permanent upgrades. Oh, so okay, like, and they're permanent. Okay. You can have two lives going in rather than one life, and then you know I think it might max out of like four or five. Um, do you ever just have moments where you realize that, that like, you've dedicated a huge portion of your life to to video games, and video games are weird as hell. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm looking at this and listening to you talk, and I'm just like, I'm why am I? I'm just nodding and like agreeing, like this is all normal. I'm like this is just what we do for our li- living. Uh, and there are boss battles. Um, so like every tenth uh, floor, 
um, you'll have a boss battle, and those are kind of randomized as well. So I've done this one with like this giant, like mech clam kind of thing, <laughs> and so it looks yeah. like a huge metal ball that you have to like crack open and right. then once it's cracked open then you can actually do damage to it but it's also spawns a bunch of ender enemies when it's cracked open oh um and then there was another one that was like it was like a bunch of spinning platters on top of each other and you, like each one was wider so it looked kind of like a funnel and you okay. had to like basically destroy each layer um <laughs> But yeah, so it's it's been fun. It's, it's it's one of those things where it's like you feel like you're having an easy time until you aren't. You will just die. Like once you get overwhelmed, it's like, oh, now I'm dead. I'm like, yeah. oh, crap. <laughs> and now I only have one life left unless I can get to a vending machine between floors. Um, so yeah, it took me a while just to like even beat one boss. Um, and so I haven't been to the top of the tower yet. Um, but I also know that, uh, so th yeah, with the pallets, the pallets are also based on uh, your weapon loadouts. Okay. So there will be a pallet for the the dualies. There's a pallet for just like... Like a color palette or... Yeah, so it's it's a like a multiple play on words. So it, like, it looks like a color palette in terms of like you've got like a bunch of squares that are opened yeah. up. And like each one of the chips that you get oh, right. from That's a floor, you slot into the pallet. Okay. And then that builds up. So, like, if you get multiple chips of the same kind, you'll, you know, extend that effect. You'll make that okay. effect better. So, like, your, like, say your armor w will go from, you know, like, 100 to 110 to 130, stuff like that. Video games, yeah. Uh, there's also pallets for stuff like uh, poison ink that'll, like, uh, so any enemies that are going through your ink will, like, take damage over time. Or there are other ones where, like, they will, they won't take damage, but they'll be slowed down. And when you hit them, if they're in your ink, you'll do more damage to them. Oh, okay. So lots of different effects like that. Um, do they stack on top of each other, or do you have to pick one or the other? Yeah, so when you do a floor, you basically choose between, like, three different objectives. And so those could be different difficulties, but they also give you different color chips. Oh, okay. So that's when you sort of decide, it's like, okay, I could do this hard one and get this chip or even sometimes you'll get double chips okay um which is nice but it's harder yeah and like some of the hard ones i was doing and like just trying to like keep up is like oh crap <laughs> right um and so it's like that's the risk it's like like will you even survive this hard one or should you go you know like if you're down to one life it's like maybe i'll pick an easy one until i can get another life back mm -hmm. um what are some of the other objectives oh there's like a tower thing so like you shoot the tower and it moves along a track Okay. And goes through checkpoints and like it keeps and and you basically get it to the the end of that track, um, and then all the enemies are brand new. Uh, the story is a whole new thing um, that uh, you, you you meet up with the basically Pearl and Marina from Splatoon Two. So, okay. so you get to interact with them That's this fun. time around, um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think about what else. There is there. Oh, there are some um, that are like similar to the multiplayer where you have like the, the zone defense. Mm -hmm. So you have to put your color down and then defend it from the enemies coming in. And some of those were some of the harder ones that I, I had to do because it's like I would get one. You'd have to like control two zones on opposite side of the map. And like you'd have to like go at them from above. Uh, and so like, I would get one zone back and then they would be guys on the other side and then oh. there'd be some sniper shooting at me totally. from the top of some tower. I'm like, all right, <laughs> chill out. <laughs> uh, your drone is a whole new thing too. Uh, so that Pearl is controlling this little little drone flying yeah. alongside of you. And there are a bunch of power-ups for, for her as well. Uh, and so- That's what you were grabbing on to? Like, yeah, so you okay. can use her to float down from high spaces. Um, but then she can also have different weapons that she's equipped with uh, and different buffs to those. So it's like they'll take less time for certain cooldowns for certain weapons or just less time for cooldowns overall. Mm. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think about is there anything else? How's the music? Oh. The music has been pretty good. Um, I'm trying, like. But that's the thing is like when you're in these situations, like a lot of times, like it's because the levels are so fast, 
like you don't get time to appreciate that music. You're right. just like you're just like in and out. It's like just, I gotta do this. Um, but I, yeah, there were there's definitely some cool music during uh, boss fights. Uh, when you start off, there's basically it's almost like a tutorial tower to start things off and kind of introduce you to the story and everything. So it's like you do ten floors at first, and then you get the title screen. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and then after that, it's like 30 floors uh, to get through the whole tower. Um, but it, 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 like I was saying, it encourages you to, um, to do it with different pallets, which means doing it with different weapon loadouts. So mm. um, you get rewards for getting to certain benchmarks on the tower, um, but you only get those once per loadout. So... Yeah. So yeah, they're definitely encouraging you to, to do okay. it multiple times. I'm curious when I get to the top of the tower what'll happen and like what it takes to roll credits and all that good stuff. Yeah. But um, and yeah, reading this description. So this whole mode is based off of a a Splatfest event and the results of a Splatfest event. Like oh. what? Like yeah, uh, yeah. No, there so is a like, chaos and order. And I think, I think lost, this goes into the so this story, is like, but yeah. Yeah, so like they, yeah. So that's they took awesome. like a Splatfest event and incorporated it into like the lore. That's kind of cool. That's really cool. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, yes. Because basically what, what's happening is there's like a VR simulation that Marina has created. But within that simulation, uh, this like AI entity called Order has taken over. Mm. Uh, and it's like sucking people into VR and sapping their wills. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> yeah. So you have to take down order. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and rescue all the people that are imprisoned in the, in the virtual reality. Love Anyways, that. I feel like I was like all over the place with that. If but. you die in Splatoon, you die in real life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Just that, that, that kind of trying to get better every time it, it just it hurts so bad like when you climb up to one of those boss fights and you're like i got this <laughs> like two more layers left on this guy and then like all of a sudden you get overwhelmed you're and you're out of ink, ink yeah. and you're like oh dang it i'm dead <laughs> yeah so i think it's the thing is like it mixes elements of like the regular single player with some elements of like the salmon run co-op a little oh, bit okay. because they just have that like sense of just like there's just like this nonstop uh, barrage of enemies coming at you, um, and you have to kind of learn how to deal with them. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, next up, all right, let's get to the the rough news, the bad news. Uh, we've been talking about this almost every week this year. Uh, the layoffs going on in the industry, and this week has been uh, a doozy. Uh, to say the least. We've got a lot to go through. I don't know if we have anything really new to say necessarily other than things Fire the CEOs. pertaining to these companies specifically. Uh, yeah. We'll just kind of get you updated on what's happening. Uh, so the biggest one uh, is PlayStation. Uh, they are laying off 900 employees across Jeez. PlayStation Studios, including Naughty Dog, Insomniac, Gorilla, Fire Sprite, uh, people at the main PlayStation HQ. Studio London is just gone. Ugh. The teams that came up with like the iToy and SingStar and all that and have been a big part of the VR stuff. It's like, nope, they're, they're just gone now. Uh, apparently there's a Twisted Metal game that's been canceled. Oh, man. Uh, and then, like I said, the VR stuff is clearly taking a hit, which has not seemed to have been a priority for... Sony for the last yeah. year since they launched PSVR yeah, it's, 2. It's weird they put out v, v, VR 2 and then like barely heard anything about it. Right. Is, is it a report or is it confirmed that they're trying to get it maybe to bring it to PC PSVR 2? There have been talks it about it, that but I have not seen like, like anything. They haven't said that, anything if, concrete. If that's true it seems like yeah they're just willing to like give it like some kind of life but hasn't achieved the results they've desired. Yeah. It's weird because it's like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's not going to achieve, achieve results. You didn't put any chutzpah behind it. But then at the same time, it's like, well, you didn't put any juice behind it because obviously nobody was buying it. I don't know. Right, it's, but it's, it's, it's why like a whore, chicken and the egg thing. Why even put out PSVR 2 at car. all? Exactly. Then, yeah. Especially if it's not backwards compatible. Like you had a launch, you had a big launch, and then it kind of 
disappeared other than third parties. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. Uh, And now they fired everybody, so. Yeah. But that's the thing, like, especially between Studio London getting shut down and Fire Sprite, which they bought just a couple years ago, uh, losing people. Yeah, it seems like. It seems like they are moving away from VR, um, which it already seemed like that. But. Yeah. Uh, but Insomniac is one of the crazier ones because Spider-Man 2 is the fastest selling PlayStation right. game in history and right. it sold 10 million copies, just got a bunch of awards, and uh, they're losing people. So if you're not doing well, you might get laid off. If you are doing well, you might get laid off. Yeah, well, you just it's might weird. Get laid off. It's weird too because it's like, uh, is this because the way that games companies used to go is like you hire on for a project, and then once the project is out, you let all the freelancers go. Well, that's like, contract. That's, they, but that's a different than people. That's how they used to do it. The studio. I mean, they still right. have contractors, and there's still a lot of problems with that. Yeah. Um, but this is different from that. This is employees, staff that's getting yeah. fired. Yeah, right. La- laid off. Yeah, they don't tell anybody about the contractors. It's crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, because you just <laughs> you just get let go sometimes as a contractor, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's why it's particularly nuts. I also wonder because it's only been a couple of years since they purchased Insomniac as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm very curious. The question we wouldn't know the answer to is if Insomniac were still independent, right? Whether they would be going through this you know right Um, yeah like is this a redundancies thing on like larger corporate level or some weird oh yeah it's totally a larger corporate nonsense thing but we also just said that ps5 is outpacing the ps3 and the ps4 right like sony is not doing bad yeah but they are spending a lot of money it's weird. Like it's it's just so weird. Like banging like banger years, banner years, and everyone's just getting fired. And it's like like I don't think it's AI or anything. Like I don't think people's jobs are being replaced. They're just letting people go. They don't care. I don't right. know. They overhired yeah. during COVID too, but That yeah. is definitely one of the things that's been cited. That's what they're yeah. claiming. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. they're claiming. Ugh. Yeah. Quit buying people. I- Quit acquiring people. Quit acquiring companies if you're just going to fire everybody. Yeah. Leave them alone. I mean, those are like the big culprits, but there's also people who are talking behind the scenes saying that they're just hearing companies are doing this because it's like everyone's doing it. So it's like cover to just start doing it so they could shed people. Because every, yeah, because it's their share value for their shareholders. It gives them the appearance of being responsible or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that the most bleak thing was like, and people were commenting on this before when Microsoft laid a bunch of people off, but like they're reporting it on Bloomberg and the ticker, the stock ticker was actively going up as they were announcing more layoffs. And it's like, that's the shareholders, Huber. That's what, (laughs) that's who you're mad about. It's the, it's the board. It's the, it's the number. Yeah. Just. Yeah, this just sends like a. It's just been sending a really shitty message to anyone who wants to get in this industry. That I mean, it, like everyone is getting like laid off, and the people who are still around. They're wondering if they're gonna, you know, keep you know having a job down the road because everyone just keeps saying like, oh, it's not over. Like, there's gonna be a lot more, and it's like gonna be a rough ride for like a little bit of more of a year or so. And all these people getting laid off. It's like where did like where did they go? And there's so many people trying to like vie for like the few positions that are open. It's just, I don't know how, how, when we're going to see like the effects of all of this. I yeah. mean, losing so many talent, how many people just exit altogether and just never come back to this industry? Did they take this opportunity to just like leave? How many talented people are just going? Right. What does it mean for, you know, the, the composition of these workforces? You know, like we haven't like seen the numbers breakdown of like who's actually being letting go. And it's like, is it also affecting, you know, like diversity in the long term? Like we have, like I have no idea because they don't share these numbers. So we just see like the raw numbers of people who are let go. So I think it's be a few years before we see like the impact of this. But also at the same time, the other headlines are that these companies are like they're putting all their chips into established safe bets. So right. they're not taking risks. They're they're cutting a lot of projects. So it could also be they are just scaling down. And but that's also just as bad. Like it, it's because now we're just gonna get 
pure games, safer games, and some of the even the ones you're like, oh, that even if you're in the mindset like that's great, it's only the games I care about, and they're just gonna keep going on. It's like, well, they're just gonna get like stale and old if you don't have like new ideas to like reinvigorate them. Like it's just gonna get like so matter of fact that it, it's not gonna like it's gonna get boring at some point, right? Like you need those unique, creative, new ideas to be infused into those projects and. Yeah, my my gut is that this yeah like in a few years we're just gonna see like man like that was a disaster for us and we're still like reeling from the effects of it and yeah I, I don't know what to say like other places have better protections and or force companies to explore other av all avenues before they can lay off people and I mean it's you know we're seeing that like over in like specifically in Japan that they have to, you know, the company has to severely be at like financial risk yeah. before they can even consider laying off anyone. And like, that means like executives taking huge pay cuts, like everything has been done and there's oversight here. And like someone brought it down, like showing every country about like notifications for like, you're about like in the U like, was it UK and Europe? They're like, they're getting, they get a notice says like the government has been informed that we want to get rid of your position but you're still here for now. Like, we'll let you know. And it's like other, like Japan, like you, you're protected because we can't let you go. And it's like us day of shadow drop. Yeah. You're, 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 you're fired. It's like, what? It's like something has to, and it's not just this industry. It's like, it, like a lot of other industries. I mean, right now it's gaming and tech, you know, who knows what it'll be, you know, in the next few years. So and it just speaks to like, as well, it just speaks to like, you know, probably need more, you know, more unionization to yeah. protect like employees. And I mean, infinite growth is not sustainable. Like I, we can't have downturn times and it's like, this is the, this is like the, the thing, you know, there has, there, there has to be some other solution to this because even, you know, they, I, they probably don't care, but like, sure. You're maybe like securing, you're shoring up your profits and stuff, but like your products are going to suffer. And like at the yeah. end of the day, it's like your 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 company might like in the long term fail because of this decision. You like right. basically it's this is the decision you're gonna look back on. But then some of these like high level people, they have their golden parachutes. They're just like, bye. Like I don't care. Like right. I, I'm out of here no matter what, and I'm getting paid. So well, that was, like that's that was like one the of the problem. things, Damiani, that was like really like I, I I it's 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 weird to like necessarily say what the heck was going on here, but it's just like they're saying uh, Jim Ryan was just at. Uh, Studio London, the like London, five, yep. five days before this announcement, like, and they like celebrated his retirement and everything. And then there's an episode of Succession where this literally happens. By the way, like a character goes to a company they acquired, and they're like, "Hey, this is great, we love you, you're all good." And then he fires everyone like three days later. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, Studio London's been around for a succession. long time, but um, but yeah, it's like it's weird. Like he was just there and celebrating, and like knew behind the scenes he had been talking with. The rest of the team about all this stuff it's like strange i also think one of the maybe positive consequences we see going forward is more independent studios yeah more seriously considering maintaining their independence rather than getting a payday and being acquired by yeah. a bigger studio publisher i well, think it, you're gonna see all... more people turn that down well, yeah. like, we'll, nope, we'll, we'll get into some of these others there's there's some positive sides on that but there's also some very you know like people are having a hard time finding any kind of funding right now as oh well. it's it's horrible out there for yeah. for like everybody like everything is taking a downturn right now and it's like it's it's just there's so much short-sighted thinking happening and this is the result of different kinds of short-sighted thinking thinking from a couple of years ago where it's like oh we're we're in an upswing. Let's hire up, you know, and like not think about the sustainability of that. Let's well, be in a competition between Sony, Microsoft, and Embracer Group to buy as many to buy companies as, much as we yeah. can. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, hey, are we actually thinking this through? Like, are we, are we projecting nope. ahead five, ten years nope. with this? Like, are we hiring a nope. number of people that we could sustain even through a down period? Like, obviously not. Obviously, uh. that's not what they're doing. I, mean, I like quarterly what, report looks good though. Right. Quarterly report and, right. for the shareholders looks good. Right, and right. Like, I like what quarter, uh, that, Miyazaki yeah. said about. The, I don't know if you have that in there, but he he was saying like that they just hired talented people and they're keeping them. Right. And that's yeah. how they don't fight. I mean, like that's how they're able to turn out something that, like Elden whether or so not quickly, there's a yeah. lot of crunch at that company. Like I don't no, know, but not like just that 
Rebirth. But, they uh, they just talked about that as well. They right. kept the remake staff. They didn't let them go. Like they kept their staff. Like well, and yes. there's there's yeah. something else that I see happen too, where it's like, and this this has been uh, you know since time immemorial. But like we taught, we learned about this in in film school and stuff, where like our teachers were like, hey, don't charge shitty super low rates because it's actually bad for everybody uh, because you're undercutting the market which will lead to the people in the middle all getting gouged out and new lesser skilled, like straight out of college talent like yourselves, like myself at that time, they were talking to me at, in college, you know, will fill in these gaps. But like, you don't have the like longer wisdom, basically. Like your wisdom stat's not super high because you're starting out, right? And it's like, like, should your rate be as high as, as someone who's a 20-year veteran? No, but, like, you shouldn't undercut everybody else just to get in, you know? And that's what it feels like this is happening is, like, the the C-suite is staying in place because they're the old fogies who are just, like, an oligarchy taking over everything and staying and not leaving power, not ceding power, not aging out and stopping being a fucking part of things. But, like, you know they fire everyone in the middle, hire cheap talent from wherever, you know, and then just fire them again and get the new cheaper talent. And it's just like, that isn't fostering confidence. One, it's not long-term thinking. And it's just like, you're not going to get like, can new talent come up with huge and amazing new innovative ideas? Obviously. Yes. But like, there is definite value to experience too. And like, hanging on to talented team members is so important for that. And it's just like, yeah. well, even just the, you know, like what you were saying with, uh, from software, like they were talking about like just the fact of like, they've already worked together. They already know how, right. Who to talk to. And like, as a team, right. Like where to go and how to get, and that's why like, done. that's why, that's why two years ago, three years ago, when, when a bunch of the people that are getting hired or fired now were hired, you know, that's part, that's a different, that's the different side of this foresight coin, right? Where it's like, you have to hire intelligently too. hire people that will fit in with your team, will, will fit in with the culture at your place and don't hire too many people. And, you know, like, even if you, <laughs> like, obviously if it were easy, everyone would run a great company, right? Like, shit, we're not great at it, <laughs> but like, you know, you gotta play those, those dice and like, think through all the angles and be like okay we're a little short staffed right now we can hire contract work that knows it's a contract mm -hmm. you know to shore that up instead of hiring a bunch of staff and firing them a year later uh it's just ugh. i don't know like people are so short-sighted it blows my mind and like everyone getting fired now is going to have ramifications later like like damiani was saying that like who knows what's going to happen later and like Eventually, yeah, will everyone lose confidence in this sector entirely? And, like, will the bottom fall out? And, like, all the investors will dry up? Like, I don't know. Like, it's it's all crazy. <laughs> Let's get to some of the, these other ones, because I think some of these are going to hit on some of the things you're talking about. Uh, EA, next up, laying off 670 people. Uh, and some of the reasoning here is, is a, some of this stuff is a little weird, because they're saying they're now... They want to move away from licensed IP to original IP, <laughs> which is great like news for the people that are starting on Iron Man and Black Panther. Uh, didn't they also just cancel some other, like... They, they just canceled the Star Wars FPS right, right. Uh, with this uh, that was in development at Respawn. Um, I, okay, take this with a grain of salt because this is just something I like saw fly by and I don't know the, the full truth to, but I had heard that there was... A person who had just been hired after being laid off from Blizzard for oh, this Star no. Wars project, and so now they're getting laid off again. Oh no! So this there, is the other somewhere out there. There's a person who's like collecting the exodia of getting laid off. Like they get hired and then fired and hired and fired. It's like yeah. the least lucky person. Uh, God. Ridgeline Games, that was established in 2022, one of EA Studios. Uh, Marcus Leto, who used to be with Halo back in the day, yeah, he was heading that up. He decided he's leaving. Okay. Uh, and they're just now they're closing that whole studio down. Jeez. Uh, and uh, they were going to be working on the campaign for the next Battlefield, 
Uh, so now Criterion is now going to be heading that up. Uh, and then some of the Ridgeline team are going to move to Ripple Effect, uh, which is um, another one of EA Studios here in L.A. Okay. Uh, it was previously Dice L.A. or whatever. But yeah, the whole thing about moving to original IP, I'm like, what are you, EA, what are you talking about? Like, you've just, like, run all your original IP into the ground. The right. only thing you have right now is Dead Space. So. Like, right. <laughs> like, and also, the didn't, Sims, they just make, didn't they just make the Didn't they just make the opposite of that announcement like three years ago? Right. Or somebody did. Yeah, you, have, you do have Apex. Battlefield and Apex. And you do have um, Dragon Apex Age and Mass Effect strong, eventually, right? whenever those happen. <laughs> but race for that. It does feel like they're going back and forth. Yeah. Um, and also, like, Bioware can't be printing money. Like, no. They're, just, <laughs> they're, just, they're, you know, right now it's like payoff will be whenever Dragon Age comes out. Theoretically, but, yeah. Um, but Hopefully. yeah, so it's just, I don't know what's going on there. They just they feel like they're flip-flopping. Also, somebody pointed out that like they bought back like a ton of stock last year, and it's like, well, if you hadn't have done that, you could have yeah. <laughs> afforded to keep people on. Um, people don't matter, blood. Money matters. It's weird. <sighs> uh, Die Gute Fabrik Makers of Salt Sea Chronicles, Mutazione, Sports Friends, uh, they are halting production, effectively shutting down the studio entirely. That's uh, a bummer, man. After they had failed to find uh, funding uh, from investors or publishers. Uh, they may return in some form uh, if they can get funding in the future, but essentially at that point, it would probably be like a full new team. You yeah. just like call everybody up and be like, hey, are you working anywhere yet? <laughs> um Supermassive, uh, makers of Until Dawn and the Dark Pictures Anthology is losing about 90 staff. That that one hurts, That's man. That's about a third of the studio. Yeah. Mm. Ugh, I love those games. Yeah. Damn it. Uh, also Ugh. love uh, Deck Nine, makers of oh, Life is Strange, True yeah. Colors, and The Expanse. Yeah. Oh. They're laying off 20% of their staff, about 30 people. Damn it, that Expanse game was good, dude. Um. Apparently, the leadership uh, there did take pay cuts as well to reduce how many people they'd have to lay off. Well, that's something, I guess. Um, but they already lost 30 people last year as well. Man. Uh, Jason Schreier is reporting that Rockstar is implementing a mandatory return to office uh, as they head into the final stretches of GTA 6, which many view as essentially soft layoffs. Yep. Uh, right. Since they... some people simply won't or can't yeah. move to wherever the offices are. Uh, and so those people are basically just going to have to quit, and they're not so they wouldn't get severance. Which is like yeah, more insidious because you don't get severance or, or the negative publicity of all that. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's dirty. Yeah. Uh, Star Citizen developers Cloud Imperium is reportedly laying off unspecified numbers of employees. Uh, How? Game's not even That's out yet. So much money from that game. What? Record funding. How? This is a similar situation where they're like return to office kind of thing. Uh, and then uh, some of the people had said that, uh, yeah, it was framed as a relocation. And they also went up further to call the studio highly toxic. Woo. Sorry. The person who said that said that? Yeah. Yeah. One of the people that, that uh, lost their job. Well, that's a bummer. Um,. Blake Hester uh, has been laid off from Game Informer. Mm. We're down to like five or six staff writers uh, already operating with way too small of a team. Just out of nowhere, Game, yeah, GameStop decided to lay him off. They've gone through layoff after layoff and have not been able to replace those people. I uh, mean, <laughs> would you want to go <laughs> work there if you're just going to get laid off every five minutes? Right. Yeah, that's what's well. I mean, but it's not even that. It's like they don't have the positions, right? Like right. they're having to run more, more and more of their operation off of freelancers. Dude, that—that's the other half of this. Like, it's happened to each of us over the years. It's happened to so many friends of mine. Where it's like, the your somebody's position, like somebody gets let go from a position, right? But then management expects those same duties to still get done. Right. So yeah, like, I mean, he was the, he was one of the senior one guys. One person ends up doing five people's jobs. It's insane. Like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. I remember at GT when Chris was like three dudes, <laughs> and I was just like, "You poor bastard!" Like, come on. Uh, and then we want to talk about consequences. Here's some here's some funny, not funny consequences. Um, 
After letting go of most of the development team behind them's fighting herds in December, including QA, uh, publisher Modus Games decided it would still be a good idea to release an unfinished final patch with paid DLC. Apparently, the characters can execute infinite unbreakable combos, <laughs> and the patch also causes game freezing bugs. Uh, you don't need to A that Q, though. Fire all those guys. Quote, we've literally been waiting almost three months for this day so we could tell you this character is not done. Ban her or play on a different version. Who needs developers to develop your game, right? <laughs> Ooh. <sighs> well, now I'm depressed. Yeah. So now, positive side of things. Uh, after the success of Alan Wake 2... Remedy has reached an agreement with 505 Games yes. to give yes. them control over control. I saw this. I was like, this is so good. They can they can like basically do whatever they want with control now? Yep. More or less? This transaction will enable us to negotiate better deals for current and future control games. Current and future control games. We Woo. can now weigh up the options between self-publishing and new publishing partners uh, for C Condor and Control 2. At the same time, we are, in, <laughs> Condor, I forgot about uh, we are in a better negotiating position than before as Control is an established brand and Alan Wake 2 has been successful. Uh, we are confident that these factors combined will enable us to get to the right partner, deal structure, and risk-reward profile that benefit Remedy and are the best fit for the Control franchise. We will evaluate and negotiate with potential future partners over the coming months. Hell yeah. So 505 basically has, you know, will continue to be part of control and get royalties and stuff to the yeah. end of the year and then after that oh just to the end of the year yeah then it's wow over to uh to remedy i wonder if they still have like right of first refusal on if they're going to even take new deals to them or not like i wonder if they were dishap displeased yeah i don't them. think so i think that you know and 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 the sort of bittersweet side of that is you know 505 and their pirate company have you know reportedly been going through issues of true it, which we talked about in the past few weeks so, like, they have an incentive to sell what they can sell. Um, I love Control, dude. Control's, like, one of my favorite Remedy games, and I'm really excited that they can yeah. steer the ship a little bit. As soon as they got that Alan Wake 2 paycheck, then yep. it's like, all right. <laughs> control. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's buy our stuff. Let's own our stuff. Yeah. It's good to own that stuff. Uh, Jason Schreier is also reporting that Saber Interactive is breaking away from the Embracer Group uh, <laughs> in a $500 million deal to become a privately owned company. Uh, right alongside them, Gearbox mm. is not far behind, should close a deal next month. Um, to get unembraced. Having to, to buy your freedom. <laughs> Buying your own freedom back. <laughs> Holy shit. What, uh, who's the first one? Saber? Or mm -hmm. Sa okay. Yeah, Saber has like 3,500 employees. There's yeah, huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do all kinds of stuff. But yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy to me when I heard that Gearbox got embraced. Um, yeah. So I was expecting them to be one of the first ones to like, hey, you know what? We're out. <laughs> We're not gonna let you shut us down. Yeah. Um, That's wild. The the one thing to be aware of and, and keep an eye on though is that those moves themselves could result in oh, more sure. layoffs because yeah, yeah. it's like, okay, we're independent now. We don't have the yeah. We just spent five hundred million dollars buying our company back. We got to yeah. lay off half our staff. Yeah, I could I could see that. Yeah, so we'll see. <sighs> uh, and then lastly, uh, Toys for Bob, uh, who there's a lot of uncertainty. What was what's going on with them after the Microsoft layoffs? People were like wondering, like, are they shutting down the studio? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, they are actually also going independent. Oh. Uh, so they are spinning off. They've been part of Activision for many years. Um, but now after this Microsoft acquisition and losing some people in layoffs, they're like, hey, you know, you know what? We're going to go do our own thing. Yeah. Uh, but along with that, they are going to uh, possibly partner with Microsoft anyways. Oh. So they'll be their own company, but they'll still make games for Microsoft. But they'll be like, hey, you know what? We'll make games for you. We don't want you telling us who to lay off. Right. <laughs> they should make banjo. Yeah. Yeah, that's a make good one. Banjo, please. Let What's them the make banjo made? Microsoft. The cra uh, Crash, the Rumble Team one. Team Rumble, I think, okay. wasn't it? The one that, I was going to say, it's been a minute since the uh, Skylanders. They did Crash 4, Spyro Ignited Trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. Skylanders. Yeah. Yeah. So, good on them. 
So hopefully everything will go well with those guys. Yeah. Going independent. Also this week, EA Sports WRC and Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line <laughs> both stopped working on February 29th. Someone in chat said they got Y2K'd. Yeah. Neither <laughs> game accounted for Leap Day in their calendars. Uh, and so they were just hard crashing when you'd boot them up. Oopsie. EA told players to change their console settings to March 1st. <laughs> I don't know what will happen the next day. Yeah. I don't know if your, your Error. files are going to get screwed up if you have two days. March 1st, the sequel. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, another fun whoopsie. Japanese copies of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth oh, right. were misprinted. So the two discs have the wrong labels. The play disc is the install <laughs> disc, and the install disc is the play disc. Yep, yep. Uh, that's a big game. Yeah. Big game. Yeah, that's a big, oh my god. That's gosh. a big, big old download. Yeah. For those of us who don't have it. 45 gigs. It was more than that, 160 something when I downloaded it's it. a lot. Yeah, it was. It said 145 for me. It's a a ton. Uh, Play this, Don. Uh, Aerial Knights' uh, new game, We Never Yield, is coming this summer. Uh, Quote a pulse pounding, stylized action game that challenges players to run, jump, slide over obstacles, and attack enemies in an intense two player local cooperative mode. Uh, Players can control both characters simultaneously in single player mode as well uh, for an extra challenge. Uh, Heart Racing Beats guide the Heroic Brothers through the game's dangerous and challenging environments as they race through intense episodes with immense boss battles throughout. Uh, And another fun uh, fact uh, with this is uh, Blessing from Kind of Funny is one of the actors in the game. Oh, really? Sick. So that's coming out this summer. Congrats, Blessing. That's cool. Uh, NetEase. Not worried about these layoffs, apparently. They got another studio. Spinning up, this time in L.A., uh-huh. uh, Bullet Farm, uh, led by David Vonderhaar, uh, who was best known for leadership on Call of Duty stuff. I assume that's a Mad Max reference. Maybe. I don't know. The Bullet Farmer is a character in Mad Max. Yeah. Uh, the studio is developing an ambitious new AAA game set in an original universe with an emphasis on co-op gameplay. Hmm. All so, right. They got studios all, all over the place. <laughs> Uh, Don, go ahead and roll this. Uh, little, little Devil Inside has reemerged. I missed this oh. one last week. Oh. Um, it's been a minute since we heard yeah. about this game. Actual and years. <laughs> they put out a Kickstarter post apologizing for the delays and the lack of communication. Uh, it sounds like f- they didn't like go into details, but it sounds like they had some internal conflicts and struggles and stuff, and they're like, all right, we've learned a lot of things. We're in a much stronger place right now. Uh, things are back on track now. And uh, they are going to now be uh, looking uh, specifically to, to find a publisher and all of that. Uh, and as part of the update, they released this, uh, this rough video uh, stringing together uh, some different elements of gameplay uh, from where the game currently is at. Yeah. So it's got some really cool art stuff. I love the map. The, yeah, the world map is so pretty. Yeah. That like tilt shift is so cool looking. Yeah, I think it's still probably a ways out, so but tilt, tilt shift, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so hopefully uh, they'll find a publisher and and we'll hear more about when this thing's actually finally going to come out soon. Bonkers. Researchers in Shanghai have developed a quote very big disc. Ah, uh, yeah, I was reading <laughs> about this. Crazy, like uh, two hundred terabytes or something. Yes, it's capable of holding 200 terabytes of data, although they still need to it's create... It's pronounced data. <laughs> they do still need to create an affordable disk drive uh, yeah. that can run it at, at a fast <laughs> But it's just speed. like a normal-ass DVD. Yeah. VBDs still a ways away, but it could exist in a couple years. Awesome. They like... That could be sold at Best Buy. It's like nanometers or micrometers like printing layers and like next to each other. I was reading about this. It's super wild. Yeah, it's it's nuts. I'm extremely pumped about this VBG. Whatever yeah. it is. Very hey. nice. How much so data when... sorry, Dada, does um holding all the information of a human body take? Are we are we getting closer oh, to teleportation technology? I think it's with? far beyond that. Uh, who knows? <laughs> it's probably beyond petabytes, petabytes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Damian, what were you gonna say? 
I would say all oh, the stores are not even carrying physical media anymore. Oh, so. yeah. It's coming right. back. Physical stores are looking back. sad now. Coming back. Limited runs got it all. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, we're not talking about our Zet. What's the deal? Hmm? Are we talking about our Zet? Did, uh, we, we're not. <laughs> oh, all right. It was on the camera. <laughs> I mean, we right? could. We could throw it in there. But we're already in also this week. So. Uh, well, I'll just throw in our Z. It's sick. It's really nice. It looks really good. And one of the developers was just watching the stream. It was super nice. I like it a lot. Yeah. Check out our Z. Check out that stream. Um, run this uh, trailer for Bo. Uh, Humble announced release dates for uh, two of their games coming out. Hashtag Blood. That looks like. Is coming out uh, June 18th. And Bo Path of the Teal Lotus is a month later on July 18th. Some Okami looking shit right Yeah, here. I'm really looking yeah. forward to Bo. Uh, very cool side-scrolling Metroidvania that looks like a Japanese wall painting. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose Okami was hearkening back to something that's been around longer. Is there than a Okami. demo for that, or is this brand new announced? I think that there may have been demos for I it in like the past. I feel like I played this, or something similar yeah, to this. I, I think that there's I been swear. demos. That's like a Steam Next Fest demo or right. something at one point. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it looks sick as hell. Oh my gosh, it looks fun. Yeah. Very Ori kind of like traversal. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Woo. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in Bo. Uh, July 18th. Okay. The Future Games Show is back in March. <laughs> Thank goodness. Piling them up anytime uh -huh. they can. Uh, but this one is going to be hosted by Ben Starr. Oh, okay. Okay. As well nice. as uh, Samantha Burt, uh, who is, uh, you know, Ben's Clive in Final Fantasy 16. Samantha is Carlock. Uh, yeah, Baldur's yeah, Gate yeah. 3. She's great. They're so, great, I think, yeah. actually. They. Yeah, so two people that I that I know running this thing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> UK correspondent, Ben Starr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How you doing? Um, don't really know Samantha. I just met her at Dice briefly. but Them, I think. Uh, now it is time for Love and Respect. Love, Love and respect. respect. Brian from Happy Gaming. Hey there, allies. Are we going through the beginning of a second video game industry crash? If I'm being honest, the first crash with Atari was slightly before my time, but a lot of the factors seem similar. While some like to exclusively point fingers at the failure of ET, the broader issue is more the fact that too many companies were trying to capitalize on the market in the wrong ways. For example, pet food companies put out blatant knockoff titles of popular franchises. Adult entertainment companies sold pornographic content. Lots of large companies were trying to get the biggest piece of the pie they could without understanding what market they were buying into or what their products actually were. When the biggest and best games are selling more than ever and people are also losing their jobs more than ever, maybe something has to change. If this bursting bubble could be considered a next generation video game crash, do you think it's time for companies and studios to start scaling back? Do you think there's a world where these studios can all exist and create their games without a fear of their shareholders' inflated expectations? Yeah. Not sure. One thing I always like pointing out, though, because I always was guilty of this, is that the first video game crash was in the U.S. Um, I mean, it was broader in the U.S., but it was primarily in the yeah. U.S. So a lot of people outside the U.S. are like, video games were just fine. Like, it's just... You, you know, and the whole narrative of like Nintendo coming in to save, it's like most people in Europe are like, what are you talking about? That's not what happens. Like, oh, it's what happened here. But yes, to, to the point, I mean, I, 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 yeah, like that's the thing. Like I was saying earlier, I don't know how long it'll take to feel the effects of this um, I, I, and what they will be. I do think because of how much money sadly is involved in this industry and it's ties to other adjacent industries that it's not going to crash because it would mean like, I feel like other similar mediums would have to start crashing as well um, at this point. And I don't think there are, I mean, you're, you're seeing consolidation, I think, happening because fear of response to all the factors we talked about, good or BS, whatever you believe in them, plus like, everyone keeps anticipating some kind of like big recession hitting us and they're just like trying to shore up before it happens and whatever excuse they're using for that. Yeah. I think eventually things will like turn around. I mean, everyone always says these are like cyclical and like, I think because of the size and nature of the game industry now, I think it will weather this. It's just 
what will it look like on the other side when it starts to like grow again? And will anyone learn any of the lessons, you know, and take them to heart? You know, probably not most people, you know, sadly, the people who have the power to enact the change and instill maybe new rules and protocols to prevent, you know, this type of mass layoffs hitting, you know, for almost like a year and a half, two years now, and however long it's going to keep going. Um, but yeah, as we said, like if you like, obviously funds are not easy to come by, but if you find yourself in the the you know position, maintaining your independence seems to be, you know, more valuable than any kind of money. If you care about the legacy, the longevity of your 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 company, if there's like a project you're working on, a game that you're really passionate about. I mean, like owning that and keeping that. I mean, we're not just seeing it in games; we're seeing like musicians who are like you know trying to like buy back their you know their rights. We've had like, you know. Or like the movies have changed hands between ownership. We've seen like I'm going to bring up James Cameron. I mean, mm-hmm. we we go through like Terminator ownership. The rights to Terminator just bounced around, and you know sometimes it's you know it, where it ends up. You know, it's not always like great. You know, it's always in great hands, despite you know the people associated with it. I mean, you know maybe something like James Cameron could have bought them at some point and been like, stop making trashy sequels to these great <laughs> movies, but. Yeah, I, 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 I do worry that, you know, things will probably get a little bit worse before they get better with this. But and I, I, yeah, I don't know if people are really going to learn the lessons other than like the bad ones, which are like, don't work in this industry because it sucks and go work somewhere else where you're appreciated. Don't have to deal with like the shit. Um, I mean, you know, treated like crap in more ways than one and, you know, losing that talent forever and, you know, seeing that reflected in the games. Yeah, I mean, well put. It to me, like, yeah, what a crash looks like now versus in the late seventies and eighties is like such a different beast. You know, society is so weird, and and everything is so mixed together now. I mean, Damiani said it all, but like the the different kinds of crashes I could imagine. One that's maybe likely would involve a wider crash based probably on scarcity like chips shortages and stuff like that like if things just become less and less attainable you know like that could cause an actual crash uh but otherwise like i think that we could see a world where yeah like the little guy the middle guy gets kind of gouged out either by getting laid off or or squeezed out of the industry or just decide getting death threats for making games isn't worth it anymore so like they just stop and then all you have is like the big the big four developers just putting out stuff you know and like that that would be a form of crash too where it's like people are making billions on call of duty and madden and league of legends and nothing else exists like that that could happen too like where the the double a and single a studios just get gobbled up because you can't like because like going independent is great if you find funding if you can't find funding you can't exist so you know yeah that's what's one of the things that's interesting with epic and fortnite because fortnite is a a very big problem uh in a sense because they're gobbling up all the users yeah um, and the people that would be buying other games is like no no just keep playing fortnite and right keep buying skins yeah um uh, but at the same time like epic has been funneling some of that money into other projects and like even like you know that stuff for the like putting harmonic stuff into Fortnite itself, right? You know, um, I mean that's basically ready. Weird way one, to go right? about it, but you know, it's, folding other games into your mega game, yeah. Right. But then they also, you know, were you know a big part in Alan Wake Two coming out, so yeah. So it's it's interesting to see that stuff uh, in terms of an actual actual crash. I don't think no. there's anything even remotely like that. The stuff with with the the Atari crash is just like completely yeah it's like just completely like nonsense things that are happening like just like producing more physical cartridges than anybody would have ever bought you know and that's why stories like oh all these games got dumped into a landfill it's like (laughs) yeah yeah, you you made more cartridges than you had people to sell them to you know just dumb things like that um, and uh, there also is no way of getting information, so people just stop buying a lot of video games because 
everything they would spend money on would just be garbage because all they'd have to go on was to pitch on the back of the box or the flyers or the commercials. Yeah. You know, we didn't have like a, any, any kind of a step, not only just established magazines or ways for people to t- tell each other like, oh, this is, you know, the hot new game or whatever. It's just like people would just basically be buying stuff blind off of the shelf. Yeah. And now it's like, even though the media landscape is also a wreck, there's still the Metacritic and the Steam reviews and just all of these other avenues for people to Twitch streamers to find out about which good games there are. And we've been seeing that this year, like just Bellatio just popping up out of nowhere, you know, and it's Bellatio like, rules. you know, like nobody was predicting that <laughs> except for Wout. <laughs> wow, but has he been had the inside track. Yeah, he's been talking about it for years. <laughs> I'm, now I'm picturing like a Mega City One type future where like, or Snow Crash or something where it's like Microsoft, Sony, and, and NetEase own everything, right? <laughs> and like people are like putting out like pirate, like independent games, like like Lethal Company and stuff, like little teams of rebels putting out like right. illegal independent games, you know? Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, Embracer is essentially crashing in a way, but like, right. even they're not like fully like falling apart, you know. And, and we see people that are like, okay, we're go- we're gonna break away. We see the Saints Rose guy, Saints Row guys. They got laid off, and their whole studio got shuttered. But some of them are like building back up to be a support team, you know. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's it's funny. Like once you get to a certain scale, unless you are grievously mismanaging or going way out on a limb, like kind of like a bra- embracer did like basing on f- on futures that don't come true but like it it's tough for like if you have any assets still on hand or any cash like assets you know it, it's tough for a company like that to fail so like microsoft or sony or NetEase or whatever right. like the world would have to be ending oh, yeah, like for Nintendo them to go being out of the business. richest company in right. japan now or, yeah yeah it's like, like, like like there would have to be much, much, much more pressing, larger issues. Which, hey, we might hit in the next hundred or sure. two hundred years. But like, it would take that for these place, these companies to like go under completely because they just have so much safety net, uh, and like the nature of the market and stuff like that is like, you know, money at a certain point kind of just keeps generating itself, and like, yeah, but middle and smaller companies or if you're owned by another company you're just on the chopping block yeah from your owners or society at any moment the one thing i i do wonder about though is you know essentially um you know the games industry is a young industry yeah you know now we're like 40 50 years into it really but um but still it's like we've been in a position where it's like Gross and gross and gross and gross and gross and like and it's you know and, and it's clearly the shareholders keep expecting this exponential growth right but I think Spider Man is a good illustration of like at some point I don't know if it's in five years or in right. twenty five years all the people who want to buy this will all have the people it. that want to buy <laughs> consoles yeah. are gonna have bought consoles right. and you're not gonna be able to raise your budgets above. A certain amount because you're not going to get that money back. Well, and that's where in- technological innovation would have to branch out. I mean, like you see that with the Wii branching into like you know how many stories did you hear about Grandma bought a Wii or right, whatever? Right, right. Like that's the kind of stuff that you then need to think about and then need to do and iterate on. Like the next big thing would be. But that's the a thing, though, is that's still a different like, market, right? right? Like the mobile market is huge. Yeah. But. A lot of those mobile gamers right. are never going to be converted to buying a PlayStation Five, right? And but we'll, they can play it on their Samsung TV. But <laughs> not even that, though. That's the thing. It's like they are not even interested in the right. fact that they can play Resident Evil Village on their phone. Like right. that's not something that they want to play. Yeah, because they don't care. Right. Yeah. So, and I mean, it's like it's like I look to the film industry, right? Because it's twice as old, three, four times as old. Started in eighteen ninety, so whatever. But, like, you know, even that still has problems pretty frequently <laughs> and companies go under and, you know, so yeah. it's like th- nothing ever stays around and stays static, you know, forever. All right. From Chris Irely. Greetings, fellow allies. Is it just me or do you feel like the game industry is in a weird place <laughs> in the middle of the life cycle of this generation? 
Between Xbox starting to dip their toes into third-party publishing, the rumors of Nintendo delaying their next-generation console, and the fact Sony stated they are entering the latter stage of the life cycle of the PS5 already, while also saying they will likely not have any huge first-party releases for the next year. Not to mention all the layoffs. Uh, it makes me confused on what to expect for the foreseeable future. In previous generations, this is where we started to see the consoles hit their stride and start really showing off what the new hardware can do. And while last year we got an overdose of that, it feels like this year things are slamming on the brakes just when things were starting to get going. I just have this feeling of being lost and no clue what to expect, and I'm just waiting for things to happen. Would love to hear your take on the current environment of the industry in this generation. Well, we had two really unprecedented things happen on a huge scale over the last few years. That being, of course, COVID and the very public law proceedings of uh, Xbox oh, yeah. and Blizzard and all that, where like we literally saw their behind-the-scenes projections and we heard numbers and we got dates like new console generation 2027, 28, whatever it was. Like, we don't usually have numbers like that and see da- da- data, sorry, you know, like that um, with such concrete, you know, albeit perhaps out-of-date specificity, uh, you know, And then just COVID just really borked up everything. I mean, it's literally a once in a century thing. Yeah. And like 2023 was was kind of the oversaturation of everything that got delayed hitting. But now we're in this weird thing where it's like, are we going to have a doldrum? Like, is it going to be like, are we turning down or is it just back to what we normally would have been? Like, if that had all been metered out how it would have been, you know, would we have had this stuff? So it, it does feel like we're in this kind of strange middle ground right now where we have more information about some of these things you know than than we normally do and way less than some it's yeah it's weird i mean i agree it's just a weird time in gaming but what do you think of damiani yeah i yeah i was wondering how much of this is potentially like this might be a weird thought but up until this past generation the one ps4 uh Xbox One, uh, I guess Wii U Switch, you know, era. Generations for everyone was kind of like only like about five years. It was pretty seven, like standard, yeah, five, you know, seven. like very yeah. short. And now we're this la- the last generation we went long. This one's looking to be longer. Is this like maybe part of like the growing pains and that they're breaking from that mold? And we're seeing like some of these companies just, you know, figuring out their footing for what they should do for like, like the, like the hardware strategy end of things, when is the right time to really introduce a refresh? When is the right time to introduce a new console? Like the, so even Sony might be like, maybe they thought last generation went too long and they want this one to go shorter, but not quite as short as say like the PS3 life cycle or PS2 life cycle. So they're like, let's do something a little bit in between. And with, with Microsoft, I mean, definitely seems that they're exploring like they're, like you know going from a service end you know rather than like hardware they haven't quite crossed that bridge where letting other people make like xbox hardware just yet but they're they're doing like game pass they're doing you know they're they're letting some of their first party software come to other platforms so i think yeah they're just i think they're just like figuring things out and we also on top of all the things isla was pointing out that would have been going on as well so it's I, like part of it i think is you know, them just like kind of like they don't. I mean, they have all these decades of experience, but also they're kind of a little bit in uncharted territory with some of this stuff, and they're trying to see what works and what doesn't work with these timetables, and also factor in how expensive everything has gone for game development. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier, and now it's like some of these miscalculations or thinking it's going to take this long and it doesn't. You know, it costs the company a lot of money. So I. Yeah, I, I, I do see it as kind of like a tough spot to be. It's, you know, maybe very, it's a lot less forgiving probably than it was, I would imagine, you know, maybe like 10, 15, 20 years ago. And yeah, I I, 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 I do think that, yeah, I, I, I do think there is a little bit of like a, you know, they like to play like a little bit of a holding pattern with each other. That's the last thing yeah. I want to say. We saw that a lot with the announcements of the new Sony and Microsoft hardware for this generation. 
like the game of chicken they played of yeah. who's gonna <laughs> talk first, who's gonna say something. And I feel like they're also like, well, Nintendo will always go first because they're always ahead of us. They always introduce their new thing first, and then we go we go after them. And like, well, they continue to play that, and because we saw the but the, the change because of the you said the Microsoft. And uh, the Activision Blizzard uh, acquisition, we got those documents. You know, we weren't supposed to see them, but we saw the unredacted documents about their timetable for their yeah. refresh, for their next gen hardware. And it's like, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, what they're thinking. Is Sony even, you know, does Sony want to beat that? Does Sony, like, we have more time? Who knows? Well, and I think Sony and, said this yeah. in part maybe because of that, because, like, they probably said like well we got to mention something like that because they we know of xbox's plans you know so like they didn't want to be left out kind of you know in a weird way yeah we're seeing like the move more and more to digital and these companies kind of like walking on eggshells because they know there's a vocal group who will scream the minute they go all digital yeah we, we already saw that with xbox one yeah yeah uh, that was one of their big features they know it's going to happen and they, they they're seeing you know how the the sharks smell blood in the water about that there's waiting to pounce on that but it, all the data shows it is going that way it's more than likely in 10 15 years physical media is gonna like what we see limited run games doing now for what we think are novelty games it's probably how it's gonna work for every game that the physical release is a very hyper yeah. limited Collectors special edition. edition that sells out very quickly and costs a lot more and that is it it is like that's all it is and you can just unlimited digital. It's like it'll never sell out digital. Like what? It'll be cheaper digitally. Hopefully, I mean, still well, I mean, haven't it's, really done that yet. <laughs> it's so funny too because like console generations were so much more palpable when like there was some kind of huge le like the easiest one for me to recall is the HD jump, where it's like we were like Nintendo, what are you doing? Like we isn't HD. Everybody else is HD. Like what the hell? What's going on? You know? But it's like. In the long run, Nintendo sort of had the last laugh because they stopped running that race. You know, they stopped trying to, like, stay super technologically, you know, best graphics war. And so they're winning in, on their own other, like, golf course entirely, you know. And, like, now it's so much more nebulous. Like, console generations are c more iterative and it's kind of, you know, like, the the PS4 to the PS5 is like, yeah, it's a better thing, but it's kind of, like... It's the same thing, just right. better. Right. Like it, you know, and it's like Microsoft is doing interesting thinking, and they have been for a while, like you were saying, with the like digital thing. And it's like obviously people weren't ready for it, and people aren't ready for what they've been thinking about, you know, with everything just being like services and clouds and whatever, and you know, decentralized. But like, it was interesting when they had that little podcast a couple of weeks ago and they reassured people it's like hey we're still doing consoles we still care about that you know it was kind of interesting and fun to see them say that because i was like i i too was just like do they care anymore like is this their game anymore because it's like one way to to win a war is to stop fighting it you know it's like but yeah it's an interesting weird yeah yeah i think well there's a couple of things with the the way those playstation statements have been taken that I've, I've thought were funny because like or, or i think i've been kind of blown out of proportion because yeah. like you know what they essentially said was that like the ps5 is entering the like the latter half of its life like cycle. the last quarter and yeah, it's because it's third. like it's because the last three years are like a blur to everybody yeah like i was just looking at like gdc stuff and it was like trying to like figure out like you know if, if i if i can go or not and like looking at the budgets and like okay it's like what did i what was i spending on it in the years before, and I'm like, wait, I can't, why can't I find the receipts? It's like, oh yeah, because I didn't go to GDC for three years. Yeah, there hasn't been a GDC. <laughs> like, it's like, that's why I can't find these numbers. I don't have these receipts. But it's like, it's just like that blink between like yeah. 2019 and 2023. It's like they, those years, like they don't exist yeah. almost. And that's like one of the things that's so weird with like the PS5 still feels like it's brand new, but that was three and a half years ago. And it's right. like, yeah, of course it's, the latter half of the PS5 like life averaged cycle. out, it's it's at least halfway through, like on average from console generations. Right, right, and they but they probably will go a bit later. But I also think that like one of the reasons they're saying that is again, this is like an investor statement, and it's like like yeah, like our you know like 
our sales aren't going to continually being like running up against how many we can make. Right. You know, like that was the limiting factor for the past couple of years. Is it's like they just sell everything they can put out there, and like now that's you know. Yeah. Now you go to a Best Buy and there's 20 of them sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. That, like now yeah. that's not the same same situation. Uh, and then the other statement about the um, the lineup it was like it was I'm trying to remember exactly how it was worded, but it was basically is like like no uh, it wasn't that like they're not going to have any big games, but they're not going to have any like sequels to big known IP. So like they're not having another God of War or right. Uncharted or Last of Us or Horizon this year. Right. You know, like whatever they put out will probably be more like Hell Divers too, and it's like. Huge success, yeah. but not like what you're expecting, right? And and honestly, like kind of circling back to the layoff conversations, like I think that games like Helldivers 2 or in an extreme case, Lethal Company, stuff like that, where it's like I always talk about exploitation films in, in, in the film industry where it's like, okay... And what that term means, to my understanding, is more like, hey, we're going to exploit this particular fan base with a cheap movie that we know they're going to go see. Horror movies are are a guaranteed hit most of the time, and you can make them for, like, $5 million, and they come in and make 50 right? And, like, I think games on the scale of Hell Divers 2 would be a great way for companies yeah. to shore up, like, you know, having a bunch of staff. For yeah, example. well, but it's, what's what's tough is you know I don't know how Obsidian has figured it out. Obsidian you know, we, we've is, talked yeah, about them doing this example. a couple of times, yeah. but it's like you know when I talk to other developers and it's just like the triple A machine. It's like despite your best intentions to spin off a smaller team to do some other side thing, it's like once you're like your big game starts needing people like. Right. Those people on that smaller team just get fed to the beast, you yeah. know, rather, Which I think is rather kind than of having to hire new people. Exactly. And I think that's how it should work. For sure. But no, no, like, what I'm saying is they they don't get to make the s- smaller oh, oh, thing oh. because they end up those people that would have made the smaller thing end up having to feed the well, big right, one. Well, right, but but because of dev cycles, right, right? You don't need all the people on the big game all the time like certain parts of the cycle you need all hands on deck for god of war ragnarok whatever or avowed or whatever but then like in the part of the cycle where it's like okay the art team is done but like level design and whoever and whoever else is still working like you you people who are done with your part of the game instead of getting laid off go make pentiment right you know like that if companies just kind of did that i love that you know Obviously, it's not that simple, but you know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's what I'm essentially getting to is, is like like there are people that would like would love to do that, but then it's like easier said than done. Oh, kind absolutely, of, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not saying running yeah. a giant company is easy. <laughs> I, I can't run a company with six goddamn people in it. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that's funny to me about this, because this is you know this is not just their perception. It's like there's a lot of people talking about you know about these things that are making them nervous. Is is it like is it really like it's it feels to me like it's so focused on first party titles right we're yeah. talking about what is sony putting out this year what is xbox putting out this year what is nintendo putting out this year it's like it doesn't look like there's a whole lot coming out this year and i'm like bro i it were 2 months into the year and i'm already behind oh yeah i'm already buried under games yeah <laughs> like yeah they might not be like first party but i'm there's so much stuff that i haven't been able like, to get to already 2023 was unprecedented and should not <laughs> happen like it was too much how many beautiful games did i not play in 2023 cuz right. there were just too damn many games like i have eye strain right now because of the the games that have just come out in the last 2 weeks <laughs> yeah like Plus Warframe. And then you got stuff like Solium Infernum, which is like, yeah. like I know you would probably into would that probably game. I would probably that. But, but how? how? how am Where, I, where's it fit in? How am I going to play that? And Bellatro, and Warframe, and Rebirth. Tell me that. Pacific Rip Drive. Me this. Pacific Drive. Yeah. I'm in that damn game, and I haven't played it. <laughs> so, damn. And, anyway, and video games. <laughs> Dragon's Dogma. Dra- Rise of Ronin. Listen, Dragon's Dogma 2, I'm going to make... Space. There's mommy loves her weird little psycho baby. <laughs> I don't necessarily know what's coming after March, off the top of my head, but these first three months, there's 
There's a lot. Yeah. It's enough. <laughs> Too much. From Logan Taos. Hi, allies. I recently played through Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Hell yeah! And really enjoyed it. Yeah, you did. That game rips. Uh, it's the only Silent Hill game I've played so far. Cool way to start, honestly. Cool way to start. Uh, but I know it's a reimagining of the first game, and yeah, I thought sorta. it worked really well despite playing completely different from any other Silent Hill. Uh, with Reverse also on our minds, uh, are there any other older games you would like to see get reimaginings versus just straight remakes? Mm. Uh, could be games you didn't like very much, but you think could benefit from a new playstyle, or games you've always loved but would enjoy seeing a fresh take on. Hear me out. Last Guardian with no bird. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> just kidding. Oh my gosh. I just wanted to piss you off. No, yeah, it's um I love this stuff and obviously yeah, rebirth and and remake are are like the the S tier reimagining, you know, cuz it's dissecting itself while it's making itself again and right. I just think it's so fascinating and super interesting. But Shattered Memories being a uh, sort of a reimagining slash different take on uh, Silent Hill One, yeah, I would love to see more games kind of take that sort of sort of th- or like I think about what Separate Ways does or uh, like original to A Path B Path, where it's like they're sort of interacting with each other but not really. I really love that kind of stuff. I would love to see games that took place like. This takes place during this game. Right. You see the other parts see of town, or like you, by, ju- yeah. you just miss each other, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I really, really like that kind of stuff. And th- there were some theories that like Silent Hills 1 and 2 take place kind of simultaneously. Right. Uh, which is sort of an interesting idea. Um, it'd, be, it'd be fun to see people kind of dance with that. I can't think of a great example right now, but I like that idea. Yeah. I can't think of an example either. I'll just give a shout out to one that also just did this. I don't, but I don't know. I really needed it to do this, but it was a pr- like good surprise they did it. But uh, the Scott Pilgrim Netflix series. Oh, mm, I've heard a, that. It's a. It's basically a rebirth. Oh, I don't know if it's exactly rebirth. It's a. It's a reevaluation. I'll call right. it that a reevaluation of the uh, original story. So it's not a sequel. Uh, That's it's cool. Something else. Yeah. It's not, a, and it's not like a remake either. Um, it's funny because this is also Square Enix, but one that I think could be good for this is uh, Chrono Cross, um, and it's the very nature of it. Maybe kind of sets itself up well for that, but um, but yeah, I think that's a game that like even from when I first played it, it was like this game could use editing. Uh, <laughs> there are too many characters. The pacing is all over the place. You go through this huge chunk of time where you just like going around doing dungeons with no story happening, and then you get to the end of the game, it's like, story, 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 story. It's like, I, what? Excuse, what's happening now? Excuse me? You're throwing in, now you're throwing in links to Chrono Trigger all of a sudden? Where did that come from? Okay. And it was like, it, it just have no idea. It was like, what happened to these last 20 hours when I didn't have any story? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it would be really cool to like have something that like kind of picks up on those vibes in a way, but... Uh, but does it very differently. <laughs> it structures the game better and doesn't have a, a secret ending that's actually the true ending that you refuse to even put in the player's guide. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's also another take on this kind of idea that minor lost and dark tower spoilers, I guess, um, but where like the run that you get, the show slash the books, like may or may not be the like final run kind Mm -hmm. of you know there's a line in season five or six of lost where jacob and somebody else are talking and uh the 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 other guys like people come to the island they die you know it's just a cycle it happens over and over again like aren't you tired of losing and then jacob says like anything that like it's not over until it's over like anything before that's just progress you Mm -hmm. know and like Things where the story we're getting, like, if it's an iterative story or a Groundhog's Day type story, where it's like, these books, like Dark Tower, like, these books happen to be this particular attempt, 
but like the implication is like maybe this isn't the run you know like this isn't the final winning attempt maybe and stuff like that could be kind of interesting too where it's like a different a different kind of like I don't know how you do this in a game because <laughs> you right. want to win a game, but like, you know, like a guy den of like, of a world where it's like, okay, this one didn't, I mean like Final Fantasy Rebirth might be doing this, who knows, but, or when you get past your own fate or like, hey, we caught up to what reality was that, as far as we thought, like that kind of stuff is really cool. I haven't finished Rebirth. I'm like not that far into it. So that's not a spoiler to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be neat to like a game, something like that. What do you think, Damiani? I imagine reformulating a game where maybe like you love certain mechanics and that a game that just ah. focuses in on what you enjoy so much. So, for instance, Damiani, something that popped into mind. Like Skull and Bones, Dom. <laughs> My idea was Skull and Bones. No. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, Gravity Rush 2, for instance. I ah. love Gravity Rush 2, and I love, obviously, all the gr- gravity combat mechanics and everything, Damiani. And I do actually love everything about that game, like the open world-ish nature and all the stuff, you know, RPG-ish sort of elements. But, like, what if it was just a straight, almost level-based, individual stage-based action, you know, third-person action game where you just went heavy on just the fun of the anti-gravity mechanics, just give you a barrage of fun weapons to toy around with and just give like linear almost, and you could still do tons of flying, you know, it could be vertical in all kinds of crazy stages, but just a much more simplified where you're not doing a bunch of the other, even though I love all the quests, the photo taking, all that other stuff that's in Gravity Rush 2, but just slim it down to just making it all like intense action, like nonstop, every level is just that fun, fun gravity based battles, you know, something like that. I like, I would like to reimagine sometimes see like maybe spinoffs or something like that. Anything to get more gravity rush. And that's the other thing, (laughs) it would would kind of make the franchise more accessible to the masses because it would just be like an easily digestible way to enter and have fun. And then you see, oh, maybe I'll get into this like much bigger, more complex version of the game. I don't know. But, that makes uh, me think about neon white kind of done. Mm-hmm. Like obviously it's, oh, yeah. it's it's different mechanically than Gravity Rush. But, but just like, how simple and straightforward and that f- like nonstop it is. Sort yeah, of. neon white feels like the like speed runny go 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 kind of parts of a lot of other games just distilled into like that's what this game is. <laughs> like go, God, neon white is sick. Play neon white if you have. not That is fun. I feel yeah. that. Nice. It's time for bets. This week's bet, uh, after some delays, uh, the Thaumaturge uh, is finally out next week on March 4th. Uh, I played that last... Played it? Did I play it or did I just see it? I don't remember. I checked it out last GDC. Cool game. Uh, it's an RPG set in 1905 Warsaw in which you deal with the characters' dark pasts, literally confront their demons, uh, and use demons in battle. Uh, really, really gnarly looking creatures in this game. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to look through uh, the top 10 English reviews on Open Critic. Will I find Pokemon or Persona referenced more? And then how many times will your choice come up? So you could say five times Pokemon, eight times Persona, whichever one you're going with. Isla, the wet hummingbird, what's your pick? Uh, I did almost what you said. I said Persona will be mentioned six times and Pokemon will be mentioned eight times, giving Pokemon a plus two. Oh, uh, okay. Difference. Just the po- per- just, so just Pokemon eight times. Pokemon eight. Pokemon there up, we go. up by two. Uh, yeah. Damiani. I, I'm doubting that, but who knows? Uh, I, I said Pokemon three. Pokemon. Oh, it's only gonna be mentioned three times. Yeah. Got it. Don, fashionable manatee. This is interesting. I like this. Look at this, Damiani. Oh. Also Pokemon. Oh. Pokemon three. Three Man. times. Oh boy. Okay. I thought you asked for the difference. No, I, I clarified that multiple times. How? <laughs> which one? And then how many will it have? Oh, I thought you said how many more will it have? Uh, Gabby sent me Persona seven times. Optimistic Rat going to the Persona side. Nice. Uh, which means I'm Pokemon seven times. Ah. So if it's Persona at all, Gabby gets it. <laughs> so wait, we all said Pokemon? Everyone said Pokemon except for Gabby. So I said Pokemon eight then? Yep. Okay. 
Last week's bet. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's Woo. here. Uh, I, I Last week I asked how many words would be in the first tutorial pop-up. Oh my god. Yeah. Huber bet like 34 words. Damiani bet 100 words. Uh, Isla was not here. They both had insider knowledge. Uh, they, they didn't really. Uh, really far apart, the, though. I looked up the knowledge. answer as soon as we stopped recording. Uh. <laughs> Don bet 56 <laughs> words. Uh, Gabby bet 150 words. Uh, I bet 24 words. Words is tough, because it's like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I would say like 60, probably. The first nope. tutorial that pops up. Main menu. Press options to open the main menu. Fuck! <laughs> From there, you can review your party stats, inspect your inventory, and change your equipment. You can also adjust the various settings from the options section of the system menu. This isn't seven. common until like tr almost 20 minutes in yep. into the game. <laughs> I was surprised. Seven, right? uh, the answer there, 39 words. Okay. Oh. So but Huber, Huber got almost that win. Yeah. He said 36? So uh, 34. 34, oh, yeah. Wow. It was five off. Pretty close. Yeah. And then I wasn't even sure like whether to count main menu or not. It was like that would just made him Oh, closer, you counted so. main menu, that's why. Yeah, yeah the I, title. I thought it was 37, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that brings our scores to Stealthy Centipede 4, which he's not here, so I don't know. He goes very like, stealthy. We don't, yeah, it's, no, it's very stealthy this week. Uh, and our runner up is Pompous Cocker Spaniel 2. Let me tell you about patreon.com slash easy allies. Uh, Patreon is how we are funded, how we're supported. Uh, everything that we do here at Easy Allies, uh, including this podcast, is made possible by viewers like you uh, who tune in every week and decide uh, that they uh, enjoy this and uh, that they should help to keep it going. And uh, yeah, that's that's really uh, we've you know we've got some other things that are going on on the side, but the the main bulk, the main engine, is uh, from your participation, whether that's through Twitch subs or through one-time donations uh, or through Patreon, which is the most effective way uh, to support us uh, and keep all of this happening. Uh, at five dollars a month, uh, you get this podcast two days early. You get it ad-free. You get bonus love and respect questions. You get to submit to love and respect. Uh, so be sure, if you're in that $5 tier, try and get in there every week. Even if you don't get picked, one of these days it'll happen. Trust it. Uh, uh, the, the more people that are in there, the better. Uh, you can also submit to the wrong question. Uh, you can get in our Discord, vote in those top 10s next week. We're going to go over the top 10 detectives oh, in video games. I thought that was today. I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. It's hear. always like a week delay. Right, yeah, yeah that somebody, makes yeah. sense. Um, $10 a month, you can uh, join the contributor tier, get in on Community Showcase and Stream Team. And then $25 and up are our producers. Uh, and I uh, just sent out those fan mails today yeah. uh, for our uh, $50 tier. Uh, and our platinum producers uh, get a shout out on this podcast each and every week. This month's shout outs go to Jabwebs, Elthanis, Greg the Dark Knight Kettering, and Raymond Wheeler III. Shout out. Wow. Shout out. Nice. All right. If you did not see, uh, we just put up an interview on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, Hamaguchi-san was here at this desk. Uh, so Heber cool. got to ask a bunch of cool questions, uh, including many uh, from uh, Michael Damiani, including a very cool one from Michael Damiani that uh, they were happy <laughs> to to have gotten. Oh. Yeah. Good tease. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a nice nice thing that that Damiani is one of the very few people that even know about uh, would recognize in Rebirth and uh, yeah, he he got to pose that question to Hamaguchi how it got in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the source comes through again. The source, dude. The source. Um, but yeah, they were, you know, it was it was fun to have them here. They always love coming by. Uh, there, there was a funny thing that happened. Their 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 Uber driver uh, dropped them off a block away. Oh no! So me and Chad from Square Enix had to walk down <laughs> and pick up the folks from Japan oh, and walk no. them back. Whoopsie! <laughs> Uh, but it was all good. It was all good. We got yeah. some, some fun photos together, too. Uh, yeah. So we'll get uh, another one of those photos out uh, on the socials here in the next couple of days. Mm. 
Uh, we got some more guests coming through the next couple of weeks. Uh, I don't want to. I'm always people end up bailing at the last second, so I, I, yeah. I never want to like be too upfront with who it is. But yeah, next Friday we got a stream uh, with a guest coming up, uh, and then um, the week after that we still have somebody. So that will be remote. But then the next week uh, we have some coming into LA that will be on this desk that I've been working on getting here for a very very long time. So hopefully this will be the time that it works out. <laughs> yes, it's gonna be super fun. Super unhinged. You've been excited about getting this person for a while. Gonna love it. Gonna love it. Uh, all right. Uh, since Huber is out this week, I'm going to give the rights and responsibilities to the runner-up, which is Damiani. You get to uh. shout out uh, anything you want to shout out. You get the final word, and you get to sign off with your trademark sign off. Uh, shout out to all the companies we talked about today that uh, got their you know, second life by being able to buy their freedom or negotiate their way into having control of, you know, their their IPs again. So, you know, in a, a time when so many of these, you know, stories are about layoffs and closures, it's like, you know, a little like light in that darkness. So it's like good to, to have some of those, you know, we need some good news. So shout out to that. Um, uh, dang, I didn't really, final word. Um, I forgot, but it's final word and, and yep. sign off, right? <laughs> I, I know it's, we've been in this for a few months, and I just forget <laughs> the new things. I keep forgetting the video part, and it's like that's not part of it anymore. Um, final word. I mean, it kind of felt like that was also a little bit of like the final word right yeah. there. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Like I, 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 a final word. I'll say. Um, if, <sighs> It's really hard to tell you to like not be discouraged and, you know, like try and like have like, you know, if you have like love and passion for this industry to like, you know, have like quote unquote faith or whatever and, you know, stick at it, you know, who am I to like tell you that? But from like my perspective, I mean, yeah, I, I, it does seem like things suck, but like the hope is that they get better at some point and that, you know, staying in, you know, being able to stay in this industry and like see it maybe transform into you know what it should become you know that oh whatever way you can think of you know because a we don't want to lose you <laughs> you know we, we need you know creative people to stay in this industry and also like yeah i mean i from my perspective like i just don't see myself wanting to like do anything else so like you know just you know it's it's an it's like it feels like it's so important like i want it to improve and get better because like I'm not gonna abandon it, but I it sucks seeing how many people are suffering and you know being like forced out because of this stuff and don't have the luxury and you know privilege of being able to have like some of like the you know shielding or whatever that I like have that you know you don't have so you go through like extra shitty stuff and uh, sign off. God, I was like about to forget what my last thing was. Uh, until next time, may the way of the hero lead to the Triforce. And you can microtransact on there just as much as anything else. <laughs> the Easy Allies would like to thank our Patreon podcast producers. We apologize in advance for all the ally names we are about to misspell and mispronounce. Jabawabs, L. Thanis, Greg the Dark Knight Kettering, Jesse Blue, Raymond Wheeler III, Bradley Spees, Forever Ender, Jay Shee, Jesper Popmel Dufay, Rob Bob Will, Roy Sung, 44 Stars, Alexander Zirianov, Andre, Aurelian Grenier, Beaten Down Brian, Brandon White, Brian Kruger, Colton Piccione, Daniel Martinek, DBA, Dimitri Zidis, Douglas Chomich, Faraz Rizvi, Garrett Holfish, G. Levin, Hayden Hargraves, Happy Gaming, Jesse Blue, Jesus R., Kroldemort, Matthew Pauling, Miguel Rivas, Mo Grant, Paul Sway, Ronka Q, Ritz 1906, Robert Stoffel, Sage Mode Q, Sam Hendrick, Sigma, Stomps, Stepan Hakobian, Steps, The Banana Forklift Killer, Chum Nguyen, Zigazich, Anish Dor, Aaron Haney, Accounts Payable, Adam Henry, 
Alex Monaco, Alexander Sheck, Anna Croft, Anthony F., Anthony Galvin, Anthrioni, Antonio Coyne, Arthur Lau, Austeel, Austin Kruckmeyer, Barry Tomasini, Benjamin Miller, Bob Starling, Brian Foster, Bunny Chen, C.S. Lewis, Katie Garza, Carlos Delgato, Cassandra McKee, Chief Uhu, Chris Eccles, Christopher Santis, Clay Roberts, Colin Montot, Connell Sumlin, Corey Jackson, Corey Landega, Crumb Eyes, Culinary Stud, Cyberboa, Dan Sebring, Daniel Kozlowski, Daniel Wong, David Aniki, Edison S. Prada Jr., Enya Hink, Eric Tobias, Eric, Espen Gotchman, Ethereal Ether, Felipe Barbosa, Fishflop, Forest, Project, Gabriel Aberg, Gabriel Smith, Jen Woofels, Gino Elite, Gustav Strombaum, Harrison Holt McHale, I Sun Chor, Ian Anderson, Ivan Swade, Jack Forrest, Jan Nicholas Frogshirt Tilk, Gerald, Jesse Fish, Jesse Wilkison, John McCullough, Junya Motomura, Carl Williams, Keegan Boyle, Kevin Gillet, Laith, Leon Keyes, Linson Wu, Lister, Luis Ibarra, Lion Crown 19, Marco Hernandez, Materia Addict, Matthias Clare, Max Miller, Mazrim Tame, Megadet, Miguel, Mr. Anarchy, Nefertiti Jenkins, Nycrypt, Nikhil Sharma, Ninja Kitty Meow, Ono Turtle, Orogachino, Pablo Rodriguez, Patrick Held, Pete Shoemaker, Pixelated, Bojo TMC, Ray Aldiar, Reed Johnson, Richard Ma, Robert Seven Lee, Robin, Ryan Rudger, Salvers, Samuel Copeland, S.D. Prima, Sebastian Trier, Servino, Sean Johnstone, Sito, Sneaky Gato, Splontot, S. Snake 24, Stone Soup VT, Strikeout NZ, Sultab, Tadashi 047, Taffy 9K, T. Beaks 15, Tim Strothman, This Is My Username 1466, Tomovi Kioni, Travis Ng, Trizak, Wouter DeHaze, Yami Zetsumi, Zach Wojnar.